right. Uh, first off, my name is Miguel Last. Uh, I teach at a platform called Philosophy Portal. The website can be found there. And I started Philosophy Portal after doing a doctorate and a postdoc. I did my doctorate at a interdisciplinary complexity science uh, institute named CLEA, Centre Leo Apostol. It's in Brussels. And then doing a postdoc in uh, system science. And I want to thank FOTUS for the invitation. Um, FOTUS, uh, I think we, we formally met at the Dark Renaissance Productions yeah. uh, event in Gothenburg. And Dark Renaissance is a weird little artistic creative uh, group that I participate with and kind of have helped develop philosophically. And uh, when FOTUS offered the invitation to come here, I had absolutely no idea what to expect, but uh, it's interesting. And uh, I just want to say, like, as a, as a starting point for engaging with this group specifically, you know, I love the principle that sort of opened the, the conference, which is, you know, saying crazy things and, and having a space to say crazy things. Uh, I think that we need more and more spaces where we can precisely engage in that type of activity without either self-censorship or being scared about what the reception of others might be, as well as the principle of freedom of discourse. So just the fact that this group is embodying these principles and trying to bring that to life, I think is extremely noble. And in that sense, I'm really glad to be here. Um, however, I am at the sort of tail end of the distribution of representation in terms of uh, subjects, fields, and, and, and study. And I didn't know that coming here. So I'm just sort of processing the culture, uh, processing the backgrounds. And I wouldn't say that, well, I would say that I've, I've never sort of interacted with a group of people strongly influenced by not only just mathematics, but the computational work of uh, Stephen Wolfram. <laughs> But I'm not foreign to interacting with a strongly interdisciplinary environment. However, the institute that I did my doctorate in and the supervisor for Global Brain Singularity, and I would say the pioneer of the concept of the global brain. So like if you go on Google Scholar and just type in global brain and Heiligen, this is my supervisor, and I would say he's the pioneer of the concept. So like, if you want to go to the origin of the concept, read the papers about it, this is sort of where to go. And he really disliked Stephen Wolfram. <laughs> so I just want to, you know, so I, I don't, but, uh, but, but I, I do want to presence uh, difference. I want to presence difference, and I want to presence how difficult it is to discuss difference and how difficult it is when you encounter difference, specifically difference of discourse, and the results of the difference of discourse, uh, how difficult it is to hold that conversation. So, and, and I don't also want to present a straw man, but what he would always say to me in regard to Wolfram's work is, you know, society, basically society can't be reduced to a, a computation or, you know, the metaphor of a cellular, a cellular automata is not sort of accurate in terms of trying to think about social ecosystems. And a lot of the language that Wolfram was using uh, yesterday, and here I'm open totally to feedback from everyone because I'm not an expert in this, but, you know, when he's emphasizing computational irreducibility and, and, and uh, basically working from, let's say, a more reductionist paradigm, my supervisor would always go to what we might call an emergentist paradigm. And, and I know that that emergence is also a technically ill-defined term. And I think people who are trained in a reductionist background can become either disappointed or, I don't know, unimpressed with how ill-defined 
uh, fields that focus on, on, on emergence uh, are. Uh, I point, point to, there's some interesting history of, of evolutionary theory with the history of the concept of emergence. It's kind of come in and out of fashion. But I think one of the things that's really crucial for the concept of emergence is the nature of qualitative changes and, and quantitative increases leading to qualitative changes. And, and more importantly, that when a qualitative change occurs, it, it's, it's, you know, at least as far as I understand it, it it's, it's something that, that can't be predicted in advance. Like it's, it's and, and can't be predicted in advance uh, precisely because it, it would destroy even the concept of emergence. You know, like, like it, it's, it's, it's not even, uh, like, it, it's like it's like talking about uh, the difference between someone like myself who doesn't understand quantum physics versus a chimpanzee that doesn't understand quantum physics. It's like the chimpanzee doesn't have the condition of possibility to understand quantum physics. It's like that, that possibility doesn't exist within the chimpanzee. It's, you know, there's not a, you know, we've talked a lot about the emergence of symbolism. Is it like, in, in, in organic life, symbolism doesn't exist at all as, as, a, as a condition of possibility to learn the things that we can learn in the symbolic world. And I think the challenge of the global brain singularity is to think the impossible. That's really what it, what it, what it, what it comes down to. Trying to think the impossible. Um, and, and, and thinking the impossible uh, precisely in the sense that I think what our civilization is producing, and, and here I would frame it in, in the logic of computation, what our civilization is producing, it is possibly another evolutionary transition that will exhibit properties that, that our species doesn't currently exhibit. And, and how, do we think that, how do we think our relationship to such an alien possibility? How do we think our relationship to such an alien uh, horizon? And, and that, that, that term actually comes up a lot in my current philosophy. Global Brain Singularity is not my, my, my most recent book, but it, it is my thesis, and, and this opportunity to teach a course on it is, um, is a first for me. Okay, so in, tr in regards to my background, I've always come at things from an anthropological perspective. My actual formal background is in anthropology. And when I think about mass, when I think about physics, when I think about science, I'm thinking about human activities. I'm thinking about things humans do, basically. Um, and, and I, I want to open up sort of a, a realm of different perspectives in terms of how we might think uh, about the anthropological. And I think, um, yeah, yeah, your, your presentation brought in and presents the anthropological strongly, and I, I enjoyed that. Um, so I think I want to interface with the conference as well. So uh, like Carlos, for example, started the conference with this idea that the world is a mess, right? The, wor the world is a mess. Now, now this is not saying Carlos's opinion is exhausting the mathematical worldview or point of view, but I got the impression from his presentation that the, what we should do in response to the world as a mess is basically think in terms of discrete relations. I think just as, a, as an activity, and, and this is an activity I was thinking about last night inspired by the, uh, the posters back there, I was thinking about, and in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, is what subjects were not represented in the, the multidisciplinary. I was thinking, so what, would a, what would a theologian say in response to the world as a myth? I would say, can, it love? can I love the mess? Can I love the mess? Right? Not, not easy. Not easy to, to love the mess, but I think that's, that's where you come in theology. What would a psychoanalyst say about the mess? 
What would a psychoanalyst? Who, who, who here has ever studied psychoanalysts? I'm interested if there's any uh, psychoanalytic. Very little. Yeah. So that's another. Another. I'm uh, just trying to presence these because it's interesting. I think to think about blind spots of of, of multidisciplinarity and yeah. so. Linguistics, for example. Uh -huh. Think about the narratives and the yeah. and, and the like the symbolic construction of language and and narratives. Yeah. On society. Yeah. Absolutely. So psychoanalyst is, a, is like psychoanalyst, like psychoanalyst begins and ends with the symbolic, really. And, and so presencing that, I think what a psych, and what does a psychoanalyst do? What does a psychoanalyst do as a practice? I think what a psychoanalyst do says, tell me about the mess. Yeah. Tell me about it. Talk about it. Tell me about the mess. And then I just thought this is more but as a joke. What would a Marxist say about this? Is like, just wait until we overthrow the capitalist system and then we'll really show you mess. You know? <laughs> overthrow the mess, you know, or something like that. So I'm just trying to, to, to say this in terms of trying opening up like the different ways in which we can, from a multidisciplinary perspective, engage with. And then a philosopher might say is, well, you're presupposing the world and you're presupposing the mess. Like, <laughs> you know, that's so full of just like, what the hell's going on? So, so I just sort of say this as like a, a, a as a background. Um, I, I, I do think, though, that, that what philosophy, and, and I would say that this conference is philosophical fundamentally in the sense that I think philosophers are, at least my understanding of what, it, it's so complex to say like what is real philosophy and what's not real philosophy. But for me, the deepest philosophy is people who are willing to think in the mess of the world. And that might be a little bit anti-institutional, but I'll say that I'm just already getting too messy. Uh, the board. Sorry. The board is a mess. The board is a mess. Yeah, yeah. And 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 yeah. And 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 I I, I think I think mess is, is a good place to get comfortable in the mess. Basically, uh, I I think it, it it's it's good to get comfortable there. Um. So, but and this is comes from my main inspiration. So my ma my main inspiration is a philosopher named Slavoj Žižek. Has anyone heard Slavoj Žižek? Yeah. I'm sure most people yes. have, if not everyone. I see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Slavoj Žižek, Slavoj Žižek, he actually, he actually told me, you know, don't put my, don't put my uh, recommendation, don't put my reference on your CV because it will hurt your chances to get a, a job. It won't help your chances to get a job. But I want to give an example of what I think is. It's hard today to think in terms of absolute. It's hard today to think in terms of absolute because, because. It's really tied to a more pre-modern way of thinking, a theological way of thinking, or a pre-modern philosophical way of thinking. But I think that in his performance of his work, we get an interesting insight into how to think absolute. And it is in relationship to the mess of the world and how we, if we open to the mess of the world and we pay attention to what I might call like an absolute breaks or absolute cuts in the world, where there's no going back, where there's something that happens, something that not probably like something that actually happens, which universally changes the coordinates of the world. So if you I'm going to just going to use his actual writing background to sort of talk to, to demonstrate what I'm talking about here. So if you look at his career, his main book publication, he always takes an actual universal world event and thinks from that break thinks from that cut as an absolute cut, right? And I think this is, it's important to, I think, reflect on how radical that is, because it, it by definition can't be contained by any a priori set of categories. It's something that actually occurs and then challenges our thinking. So for example, if you look at his history of his thought, his thinking evolves from the end of the Cold War, 
the end of the Cold War and he's here trying to think ideology, that we presuppose we're not ideological. After the Cold War, you have capitalist communism tension, Cold War, that tension's over, and then we think we're not ideological, but he's saying things are more complicated. 9-11, 2008 financial collapse, and coronavirus. So, I don't know, but I don't think many of these things, of course, some people, maybe super forecasters could have predicted 2008 financial collapse, or certainly, but when it happens, you can't go back. And then the challenge is, how do you think the world from the perspective of that break? Like, I don't really think we've thought too much or too deeply about what is the social world after coronavirus? You know, like it really ruptured our social lives. It really ruptured and challenges, I think, our universal notion of politics, like how different the responses were from China to Sweden to America. So many different responses and thinking about these types of global negativities and even just the, the fact that how strange the event was. Uh, and, and thinking the, the consequences of the social world from that, all of this is to set up that for me, and this is my alignment, I think, with this conference, is for me, and this is going back to 2005, how many of you read uh, Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near? I'm super surprised. I know you, but I don't know. I'm super surprised it, it hasn't, uh, I, I would be expecting way more people here to have read that. That's the book that I see as a, a break. Develops? Sorry? What do you know? Basically, exponential computation. So, the book, uh, uh, the idea of the technological singularity. And so, like, the, the alignment, I think, with this conference is, and building on what Wolfram was saying yesterday, uh, he was going through, for example, the history of the emergence of symbolic cognition, philosophy with logic, uh, mathematical formalisms, uh, and then he emphasized uh, the development of the idea of computation as a radical break. And I think that this, the consequences of this radical break come up in the ideas of technological singularity, where a guy like Ray Kurzweil, and you look up Ray Kurzweil's everywhere and on, online, and whatever, works at Google. He's really, I think, interesting in terms of prediction and anticipation because not only does he predict certain technological trends decades into the future, which usually have a good track record, like he's also got a paper about his track record with predictions, Sometimes these guys, in my view, are a little insular. Like they, they build their own little industry. Uh, but anyway, he's got these papers about his prediction history and the accuracy of it. And he's also participating in the construction of large language models. And his most famous predictions are like, by 2029, we'll be able to completely uh, artificially simulate human language. So whether you're talking to a human or whether you're talking to a chatbot, you won't be able to tell the difference between the two. I mean, already when you call many different uh, businesses, you can't tell, am I talking to like, I've had several experiences trying to just like do my taxes or change banks where I don't even know if I'm talking to a computer or not, like where I'll say to the thing, are you a computer? <laughs> like, but but, like, but by, the idea of Kurzweil is by, by 2029, like this is going to be, universalized. And then by, so, and then by 2045, his idea seems outrageous in some ways, but just the idea that the human will basically be irrelevant evolutionarily. Like the, and so this brings back to emergence and qualitative transitions. Is, can we really think that? Like, can we really think the emergence of an other mind where this other mind with a different substrate? Is it operating by different evolutionary principles? Are we operating by different evolutionary principles than organic life? I think we are, kind of. Um, which I'll hopefully get into. Can, can we think that? Can we, and, 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 and how do we relate to that? 
And how do we, like that's that's what always blew my mind. That's what's always been motivating my, my thinking. Since 2005, I was 19 and thinking, wait, I'm going to be alive in 2045. And if I'm going to be alive in 2045, and and we're I, and I exist at a time of this great evolutionary transition where there's going to be an other type of mind that's not a human mind. What does that mean for Christ? Right? And 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 and. I guess I've stayed with that thinking path. I've stayed with that cut because I've only seen the conversation about those things grow. Like I've only seen kind of that staying with that thinking as helpful. Like in 2005, there were like really weird message boards of people nerding out over this type of stuff. And like there's a community called Singletarians. And that's how I found my way to Clay because some Singletarians were there. Um, and it was a hobby for a long time because I couldn't find at an undergraduate level any programs about the singularity, uh, or certainly not an anthropology program that would engage. But I think that anthropology programs should uh, have programs about these types of things. Um, but now it's kind of mainstream discourse now, especially with large language models coming in. And so I, I just think this is a, a big challenge for, for philosophy, but for everyone, really. Um, and there are certain presuppositions. Like the, the, there's the biggest presupposition, like if you watch documentaries or like read, just read the, the literature, the biggest presupposition I think is this idea of exponential change. Right, like Kurzweil's got these uh, slogans, axioms, that we think in linear terms, but technology is evolving in exponential terms, and because we think in linear terms and technology is evolving in exponential terms, that means something that is imminent in five years, we think is 50 years uh, in the future, or we think is hundreds of years in the future. And, and, and also there's the weird phenomenon, I think, of once something, once something quali this is a super weird thing about humans, I think, is once, once something that nobody would think could happen, happens, we act as if, of course it happened. Like, you know, like, and I, I, I saw that happening even when, when the coronavirus lockdowns were happening, like, the whole world shut down and, like, we just went around like, yeah, of course it didn't happen. You know, but like if, if you thought about that before it happened, it would be like, no, that could never happen. Right? So just thinking like if you go back to like studying in the 1920s or 1930s about what the future of technology would be, you would see like, uh, like just like the Jetsons, right? Like the uh, robots that are in your kitchen doing laundry and, and uh, cooking your food. But no one really in the 1920s was thinking about the internet. <laughs> but then the internet changed everything so fundamentally. Again, going back to emergence, like that's a good example of emergence. The internet is a great example of emergence, where you have a qualitative change that nobody could have predicted in advance. And, and, and just staying a track of all these things, because I, I feel like I don't know like what would be a good example of something that could happen in 10 years which you would say today, no, that could never happen, but in 10 years, we'll all just be accepting it as if it's like normal baseline reality. You know, like I, I was gonna propose like the idea of like people marrying uh, AI bots, but I feel like everyone here would be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll marry AI. You know, and, 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 and to me, like actually the model for that is like the movie Her. Has anyone seen the movie Her? Yeah. Great. So like the movie Her is a brilliant investigation of what it's like emotionally, existentially to be in the process of a qualitative emergence. Because the key for me is in that movie when, you know, when Samantha gives up on the possibility of ever dating Joaquin Phoenix's character. This is a bril there's a brilliant discourse there. You, you, you're not. So like there's brilliant discourse there where my interpretation of the discourse is they start to experience emotions that they don't have words for and they're increasingly ex and there's higher and higher orders of social connectivity going on that humans are not capable of processing 
And I wonder if that's like just intimating a little bit about where we're heading, like higher and higher orders of social connectivity that blow us away emotionally because we have no priors to deal with this type of emotionality. We have no language to deal with this emotionality. It really brings us to the edge of our capacity to signify. And I think that's, that's, that's where I go to in terms of the edge. Like, and again, connecting to Wolfram's lecture yesterday. So you have the emergence of the symbolic philosophy, logic, mathematics, development of the idea of computation. But it seems where we're heading is the, a deeper transition. This is, again, signifying global words and letters. In, in, the human is so symbolic. The human is so in language, which is back to why I think psychoanalyst focuses so much on language. The human is so much in language that I think we should be paying attention to where our language breaks down. We should be paying attention to where our words fail, but not in like a withdrawal from the world. In the world, where do our words fail? Because that's where I think we experience the deepest pain. When our world's words fail, we can try to withdraw from language. But I think the real challenge for the singularity is how do we stay in language and deal with the constant breakdown and basically creative destruction. I think, I think this is like you get creative destruction. And this could be also generational. So like I'm in a room, how many people here are under 30? Okay, so like this is a super interesting experience for me because I, I've never really yet been, I'm always, in my history, I've always been the young guy presenting to the older guy. But now it's reversing. And, and it, it's interesting to think about that reversal. It's interesting because the young guys, they, you know, they, they, they're, you know, the, they're another generation, basically. They're almost another species, you know, like, and, and almost, because, and especially more and more, I think, more and more, I think, another species, because you're just dealing with different, and I think this is also what I was trying to think back in 2005 with the singularity, just that, wait, like, we are so adapted, like, history is, like, history is really, like, I, but like the further you go back, it's more it's a flat line. Now it just goes like this. And so the difference between generations is going to become intense. And I think it's already intense. Like the difference in generations, that's one unpublished book I have is uh, basically about the loss of generations. Like the loss, of, and, and like in most of human history and religious history, theology, religions, all of that is based around holding the generations together. Like, it's what it's about. Like, it is this, I, it's theology is about holding the generations together, father to son, mother to daughter. What did the father do? That's what I'm going to do. What did the mother do? That's what I'm going to do. But increasingly, that's not true. Right? Like, increasingly, what your father did or what your mother did or what the older people were doing is irrelevant to what you're doing and will increasingly be irrelevant, you know? So I think, you know, this is also anthropological challenge. I'm just kind of giving an overview of going into the book. But let's see. let me now change tack and also check the time. I think. You have a clock? Yeah, I'm there. Where? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Thanks. OK. So this is a course like when, when Fotis said, no, you can, you can teach your course. Like, okay. So the question is, yeah, yeah, please, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. You tell us about the, the neurotic inability. Sorry. That the human is going to be inadequate in 2045. Well, this is something Kurzweil says. Yeah. And I, I take his technological predictions to be something to pay attention to. Yeah, and it, it connects that with the potential cycle in the generation. Do you think that we can say that in one time it's going to, to be established? 
stabilized. I believe. Yeah, so I, I've, I've, um, his name, he was on my uh, doctoral committee. His name is, please, I hope I remember his name. And I would recommend his work. Andre. I think this is how you spell his name. He's a Russian guy, Alexander Korachev. I'm pretty sure I'm botching this name. But if you look this up and like social science and Russia, you should be able to find them. But he thinks, forget the technical term, but he criticizes Kurzweil's exponential idea. So like Kurzweil's like, it's gonna go like that to a singularity and beyond the singularity, we have no idea what the hell's gonna happen. This guy says it's more like this, like S curves. Like it's gonna be like that. But like, he also says, but like then there's a, a weird paradox, I think, because the S curves get smaller and smaller. So like, go here, and so he's, he's not saying, so he, he's not saying that the, the S curves stop either. So I don't know whether that means he's just delaying his ideas about the technological singularity 150 years or something like that. But in any case, like one of the things I was trying to do with my thesis was think about the human being from the perspective of cosmic evolution to really try to situate how strange the human being is. Because when, the, when, you, when you think about the human being in relationship to cosmic evolution, to me, it's just like, holy shit, like humans are really weird. Because the, the time scales that humans seem to be doing things, it just gets small, like shorter and shorter. And so here you have the philosophy, I'm not this, I'll get you in just one sec, but I'm not this, but this is a big philosophy that's come out now because of this is, does anyone know Nick Land? You do. So look up Nick Land. It's the philosophy of, of accelerationism, which is basically just, you just affirm that and, and weird thing about accelerationist philosophy and Nick Land is like, usually he's attracted to right-wing intellectuals, but it's a weird type of right-wing intellectual. Like it's the, it, because usually you associate right-wing intellectuals with con con conservation, with conserving the past, conserving tradition. But this type of right-wing intellectual is not interested in conserving the past. They seem to be sexually excited about the extinction of the species. <laughs> you know, you know and, and, and just sort of and just sort of affirming, you know, like yes, like let's go into the apocalypse. So, sorry. We'll go you and then you what's your interpretation of the axis of the exponential? For Kurzweil the exponential is basically computational. Like I think he's I like I was I'm like in my head I'm thinking about the synergy between Wolfram and Kurzweil. Because Wolfram seems to have a computational view of everything. And, and, and Kurzweil's charts seem to be all about uh, the, the exponential power of, of computational technology. Now, I think that, like, as a philosopher, you, you start to think, well, are these overreaches of the metaphor? Right? Like, there's a long history of scientists using whatever technology is popping in, in their century to say that's the way the universe works. Right, so at the same time, I think we should pay attention to it because I do think at the same time, I don't think we should relativize science. I think science has universal consequences in terms of its output, meaning that the work that Kurzweil is doing with large language models and artificial intelligence, I think all human beings will have to confront the results of that work. Like it doesn't matter if you're a Buddhist or a Christian or it doesn't matter, like, they're here. Like if people in the Amazon are gonna have to deal with it or whatever. So it, it, in that sense, it's irrelevant. Um, was there another question? Yeah. yeah um, you say, uh, like people are really excited with the extension of the human race. Could you not like reframe that to say humans are excited about the future and like just the only constant that so, like in the future is inevitable that humans will be replaced by like something that's better? Well, I think I think that's I think I think Nick Land thinks. Well, Nick Land, Nick Land's view is like techno-capitalist singularity, like this idea that, that the fusion of capitalist neoliberal politics and technological growth 
are wedded to a future which doesn't need us anymore. It's like, and, and that there's something, something, and, and that's good, and that's good. Yeah, <laughs> just, like, that's, it, I just always think around people, like, oh, AI is going to replace humans. It's yeah. like, what's the alternative? Do you want humans yeah. to exist in the universe as long as the universe exists? Exactly. I love that question. So, like, I'm also interested in that question, but I'm not satisfied yet with our discourse around that question. And that's kind of where, hopefully, in the third class, I, I, and in the third part of the book, I talk about no, the second part of the book, I talk about, no, the third part of the book. So I talk about, uh, so we'll get into this. So like, this is my, my thing. I don't know if I'm right, obviously. Uh, I talk about, so you have like, and I don't know like if, Like you usually, so in reductionist view, in reductionist view, you usually think, well, the truth is there, right? Like you go down to the subatomic realm or whatever, and whatever quantum realm, and you think that's the truth. Then in the emergentist view, you think the opposite, basically. You think like, no, the truth is slowly emerging evolutionary process. And I just think in regards to thinking evolution, I think we're constrained. So Fotis is going to do a, a course on transcend, fuck the discipline. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I think with evolutions, kind of like, I think we do kind of need to get out of the disciplinary thinking because evolution and other philosophy, like Daniel Dennett's whole philosophy is based on this. But I think that we haven't done enough thinking yet about the different qualitative differences of evolution uh, like the way biology, like we're, we're biased by evolution emerging in biological science and natural selection as the principal mechanism. But that doesn't apply to physics, but there's still change and there's still evolution in, in, in a way. But it's not, it's not biological evolution. But I think that what the, like to me, my thinking isn't, tell me if you think I'm an idiot, but to me, my thinking is, is that the human is strange because we exist in a tension point between two different types of evolution. Like we exist in, bi and this is in the anthropological literature, they call it biocultural evolution. I think there's a different type of selection working there. But are we, like this is very speculative, but in the transition between chemistry and biology, they say it's a abiogenesis, the emergence of biology. There's a certain chemical process which is not super well understood about how something qualitatively different life emerges. And my thinking is, is our human beings as biocultural entities some sort of process that is giving birth to a different type of evolution? And, 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 and how can we think that better? And, and our, our role in that? Um, I, I want to try to express some skepticism about the idea that you is about a kind of gung ho towards change. Sorry? I said I was like, I, well, just in the sense that you talk about like how it's like, what was the of Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like how bizarre, it's, it's bizarre that it's like, uh, it's on the, it's a, it's, it's a right wing view, but they, they're, they're, they're technical they believe in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, that's not bizarre in the slightest, because mm -hmm. the classic thing about these, these technical capitalists is that um, bring on, bring on the AI and privatize the hell out of it and, you know, start a small minority will stand to gain. They don't want to change that. The, Yo, that's the, why the, it's right wing. The political, the political system doesn't change at all. No, change. that's it. That's it. Right, so, yeah. so this, for me, that's that's, good. there's no yeah. belief in the in a, in a, in a, yes. the meta, meta, metaphysical flux, flux. They believe very strongly in conservation. It's conservation yeah. of wealth and power and the, and the change yeah. is yeah. important to that. So there's, I don't understand why that, why... No, I like that. Like, it's, it's the view of accelerationism is not is not about progress in the future. The view of accelerating yes, yeah. is about, is about no. right, fun. Yeah. Yes, a hundred percent. So like this is to me where I'm like, so you have land. And thank you for that. that that's a great a great contribution. Like to me, land is about acceleration, but not about progress. Certainly not about progress in the modern ways we understand progress. In the modern ways we understand progress, Everything politically is oriented around not just freedom for a small group of people, but freedom for the whole of humanity. Uh, progress equ means equality, freedom. Like the French Revolution slogan, liberty, egality, fraternity. Like land is not that. Like <laughs> land does not give a shit about 
liberty, egality, fraternity, be like, no, let's just destroy, the, like, let's just conserve the system that undermines liberty, egality, and fraternity. So I think that's, yeah, really good. Uh, an interesting thing to know, especially when it comes to Lance's philosophy, is where it came from uh, and yeah. where it led to. Yeah. Because er especially, especially with Lance, early and late are completely different. There's yeah. a break there. There's yeah, a yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, and earlier on, where, where this uh, philosophy of acceleration is happening first, was the, all the cybernetic culture research. Absolutely. Like working in the University of Warwick. Yeah. Uh, it was more couched in a more kind of uh, Marxist, uh, Marxist. Way kind of view. Yes. Yeah. Um, Deleuze, Guattari, and Marxism. Yeah, yes. Of this kind of limit of uh, more modern uh, Marxism, of um, safety. Uh, it, it had to do basically with cybernetics and feedback. Yeah. And that in cybernetics, we usually have negative feedback loop, we have regulation, we have control, and this process of control, uh, which are applied usually yeah. to missiles and projectiles in a private society, can lead to this kind of disciplinary control societies. Uh, but basically, this kind of um, group saw the cyber and the emergence of the cyber yeah. as a form of a breaking point with with regulation and yeah. and accepting and breaking positive feedback loops and where they go like to the maximum, like just let the positive feedback loop go positive, cyber positive. Yeah, that's where this came from. Absolutely. So as kind of exponential thinking, all of that is like uh, embedded in this. Well, later on, uh, Lance had this weird turn where he actually turned very boomer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, in a way where, uh, again, it's maybe this kind of like sexual attraction to like uh, the annihilation. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Man. But because, first of all, it was more about uh, uh, positivity as a man's category. Yes. Kind of well, that was, that, that, was, that was more in this. Yeah. Yeah. But then it gets darker. And it's interesting now how acceleration is misused, especially by the more tech, the tech world. Yes, and it's going to become more used. Yeah. It's going to become a new. I think that's the what's what's going on in in certain tech circles. It has none of the grounding in this. No, no, they're not. They're philosophically. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. In the dark. Um, so I just want to say quickly. Yeah. There's. We have a, to give it with time. We have ten minutes. So. Yeah. Uh, we have lunch break afterwards. So if you want to continue with your schedule, maybe we. So 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize this point of breakdown of regulation and how important that point is, the breakdown of regulation, because this is going to have huge influences on politics uh, moving forward. But this is like, so I just taught a course on Hegel's philosophy of right, which is basically Hegel's idea of the state. And Hegel's idea of the state is super influential for the last 200 years of politics. But Hegel, in writing this in 1830s, like, and Hegel, I, like I was, what I was paying attention to when teaching that was like, what can't Hegel see in the 21st century? Because obviously he couldn't predict the future. And that's part of his philosophy, he can't predict the future. But his idea was that the state would be able to harmoniously regulate capital. And, and so like, kind of his presupposition that the state is the mechanism by which we achieve universal freedom, universal progress, uh, is embedded in his idea of the state being able to contain capital. And I think that's what Land's saying is that that's not going to happen. And we should just affirm capital mobility and all of these positive feedback loops. And if that leads to our inability. So because in Hegel's system, you have state, Community. So, like this conference, right? Community of minds thinking mathematics, right? Community. Family. In Hegel's system, this is what he calls the truth of the ethical system. So, if, so, like, so I think, like, if you have wars breaking out between states, it means communities broken down and families broken down. Because I think these are all connected. So if you have the outbreak of geopolitical tensions, major geopolitical tensions, probably there are problems here. And I think there are huge problems here, obviously. But Hegel's idea is you can tie these three together into a unity. 
But I think what Land's saying is, no, you can't, you can't do that anymore. You can't tie these three together into a unity anymore. And so then the question becomes, like again, if the species is breaking down, and these are some of the questions I try to work through in the, in the thesis, ultimately it comes down to, can we continue reproducing the species in this environment? Right? And, and I think there's some of it is a bit doomer, doom mongering. But there are, I think, some legitimate concerns about like what always surprised me was the, the decline of biological reproduction. So, like, what I mean by the decline of biological reproduction is that, of course, if the species is going to reproduce itself, and historically this was never an issue, but historically every woman would have on average five to six children before the pre-modern era, and then everyone knows there's a sharp decline. And you, the positive argument you can make is that there's been a decline towards quality, like you have one or two kids, and, and, and they get more attention, and, and they get more, more time and energy from the parents. And, uh, and, and, we're, and well, of course, we're not having six or seven kids to work on the farm anymore, right? But, but there are signs that in, like, for example, there are some countries that are ridiculous at this point, like Singapore and Korea, and even like some European countries, if it wasn't for immigration, uh, where the reproduction rates drop, like in the, the the worst statistic is like, I forget what country it is, but there's some countries that are like below one. South Korea or South Korea. Right, so like, like ridiculous. Like what the hell's going, like, and I'm just saying like, what the hell's that? Like, I don't know, just saying it as a question, like what is that? And, and, and what's the future of that? And is that like kind of like a canary in the coal mine situation? Where like, that's like the sign of the future is like we are, and like, it's a really weird thing, because like, evolutionarily speaking, like, that doesn't happen. Like, if, like, evolutionarily speaking with biology, is like, if you give any biological population an, an abundance of resources, like they get a windfall of resources, they, they reproduce so much that they undermine their own resource base. But like, when we have excess abundance of resources, we seem to do the opposite. And, and, and decrease, and, and again, you could make the argument that we're going from quantity to quality, but then there are some countries that drop off the map. So I'm just saying, it, this is all breaking down in, in relationship to that. And, and uh, yeah, so I just want to give an overview of like what I hope to like do in the next few, few days, just going through different parts of the, the thesis and then I'll stop. There's a question. Yeah. Um, just, like, whenever you see people make arguments like on the state, and they have on their friend, but not the concern or our future. It's like, this, how long has the state been running for? Like, why is that something that yeah. we... So that's, that's really, this is what we, so this is another qualitative emergence thing. Because Hegel was saying, we need to have a political philosophy of the state, because of, like, basically to mediate the transition towards our, our modern notion of rights. And that's why the book's called Philosophy of Rights. Because in pre-modern world, we didn't have rights. Yeah. So it, the states come to like mediate this. And, and again, modernists tend to have this view that the state's going to mediate the process of rights until we all have like universal freedom, liberty, equality, fraternity, or whatever. But now it seems like specifically the tension, I like what Zizek says about the tension between, he says, in the 20th century, democracy of the state and capitalism were in a marriage. And it worked. But now it's going through a divorce. And, and so, like, the state's breaking down because it can no longer control capital. And increasingly, the criticisms of, like, the EU or the United States and, and all of this, like, Trump stuff and all, all that other stuff is around this is, is, is again, capital mobility doesn't. And I, I've even heard arguments from, I, I recently interviewed a political scientist, Benjamin Studebaker, who says, even if you had a monarch, uh, you wouldn't be able to stop capital mobility anymore. So like, even if, for example, America goes to a monarchical system, and I think that when you get extreme violence directed towards the head of a state, it's the sign of, of democracies in trouble. Like if you look at the history of assassinations of US presidential candidates, there was actually a big gap of peace where no presidents had been attempted to be assassinated other than Kennedy since like the early 20th century. So there was a big gap of peace, but now we're having, I think, Presidential, yeah. Well, was the gap of peace in this, in this kind of history, according to... Well, it's just a very anecdotal thing. I was just looking at the history of assassinations of presidents. I see. And, and, and 
basically in between 1911, basically it's like the short 20th century, like in between 1911 and last week, there's been one presidential assassination attempt. Yeah, I guess the piece is, the, the chaos has been everywhere, everywhere else. Yes, 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 yes. So America is also, like, so the American state as some sort of neo-colonial entity, that is also coming to an end. And, and we're entering, like, so then you'd have philosophers like Peter Sloterdijk. Who knows Peter Sloterdijk? To you. So like Peter Sloterdijk, has this idea that we're heading to the, the away from the orb, the one 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 world thinking about one united world, into a world of like a multiplicity of chaotic forms, uh, and that's sort of where the the future of politics is going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that based on the idea about where capital is concentrated and it being kind of dispersed? Because that's. If it's like the main word to me is capital mobility and like, for example, like a, an economist like Thomas Piketty would, would have like made that argument as well. Sure. Capital mobility is like, it's kind of disingenuous to say that it's higher than ever because it's like the, the amount of relative autonomy that, like the amount of inautonomous people in the world has never been, as a proportion of the population of the world, has never been higher, has never been higher. Inautonomous. In a like, like can't move. Yeah, can't exactly. Yeah, so like there's people, more, there's more subjugation than ever. In yeah, of, so it's, it's people I, can't move, but capital can move. Yeah. Well, I don't. Yeah, we could get into debates about this, but the the main the main the main ar the main argument is that capital can freely move anywhere around the world, but people are more and more. I, I, well, and I would say people in underdeveloped countries are more and more. Uh, restricted and and basically the question of immigration. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But the, but the, like but what's undeniable is in Europe, North America, the political football of immigration is bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Which is the question of how free should the movement of peoples be, and and the asymmetry of movement, which is that everyone from the developed world, developing world, wants to move to the developed world, so brain drain and things like that, and and also. And also the stability, like, the, like this would be like the right wing argument, like the, is the stability of, of these things uh, can't withstand uh, large scale immigration because we can't have cultural, we don't have cultural continuity. There's too much um, plurality. It's global plurality of culture. And, and then like the left wing, like then I've, I've met people on the left wing say, just destroy the nation state's borders and just have anyone move ever. Like there are literally people, uh, like I get like in France, they're the far left wing party. They send mail to, that just says like, no borders. <laughs> so like you have like the no border view, you have the let's make borders way tighter view. And then the, there's like this huge like political break. The people on the right who believe in no borders, they just don't believe in their ability to fight back against mm -hmm. Like large space of immigration, it's just like it's not. Yeah, you know, the, the no borders thing I would say is local and medium from the left, but it's like it definitely yeah. it's definitely health. Like not health because of that's yeah. so like the weird thing. I don't know if you think the same thing, but like there's this idea, and then I'll stop. Yeah. So then I'll stop. Like the idea that like when you go like so I'll say like who said um, uh, but as an emotional subjective feeling, whenever I am in spaces of far left. Marxists, and whenever I'm in spaces of far right traditional conservatives, I have the exact same emotional experience. <laughs> but, but that the far left and right, they just turn into like the same thing. I don't know if that's true, but. I personally don't, don't agree, but like, I, I, I know that it's a, it's a fair argument, you know. Well, I don't, it's just what I have experienced. Okay, so that's the first class, and then hopefully. Uh, next three days, I'll be able to continue to unpack some of the ideas and go over into Thank you. And uh, the book is on Springer. It's way too expensive. So if anyone wants a free PDF copy, I can send a PDF copy. All right. All right. Let's 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 start. Um, who's been here for the all three, or sorry, all the first two? Only three. Only three. Well, you have, obviously. Yeah. Well. <laughs> and so yeah, you were here for the uh, yesterday. You weren't here yesterday. That's right. Welcome, welcome. Okay, just just starting now. Uh, 
I guess what I wanted to accomplish in the first presentation, well, one, I, I haven't been able to get as deep into the book as I anticipated. You can never, uh, you know, uh, I guess because of the Q&A dynamic and, and people getting involved, I think that's a very good thing and I'm really enjoying the way people are getting involved throughout the presentation. It does mean I can get less into the book that I want to get, but I think overall the collective dynamic and getting involved is more important than getting through the entire book. And if you do want a copy, a PDF copy of the entire book, just email me. And. Uh, and I can send you a copy. So my email is here. Because, like I said, I think Springer charges a bit too much. And if you're interested to learn more about my work, what's going on now, you go to philosophyportal.online. Uh, what I'm getting into with this book is an important part of the history of my work. It is five, yeah, I published it in 2020 and we've been working on it for like five years before publishing it. So it goes back to 2015. So my work is in a different place now, but it sort of gives an important context. And, and just in terms of what I wanted to achieve in the first lecture, I think was just sort of setting the stage for the importance of the concept of global brain singularity and bringing the entire species into a interrelation to how different uh, our environment is going to be because of exponential technological change. And then yesterday, I guess we were getting into some of the central contradictions that led me to write the book, as well as uh, how that frames, I think, the importance of our contemporary moment. Uh, so where I left off was kind of framing our contemporary moment in relationship to two main processes, which is technological complexification and socio-political convergence. And those two things are fundamentally interrelated um, in a sense that uh, the socio-political convergence is being mediated by the technological complexification. And I think the conversation about what socio-political convergence looks like in the 21st century is still very much in its early forms of, of thinking about what that means. Um, you know, we, a thread throughout both the first two presentations has been thinking about evolution in a broader sense than any way we can think about it in terms of uh, dividing it up into specific disciplines. So I want to pick up where I left off with that because I think thinking about the human species in, in terms of a universal process, so I think on the back board there, the themes are structure, process, and meaning. Uh, what I'm trying to do with this evolution concept is let's purify, maybe not the right word, but purify the concept of evolution towards a universal process and thinking about it in terms of a universal process. And how does that change the way we have to, how does that challenge the way we have to think about evolution? But also, how does that help us situate the human phenomena? in cosmic time and also give us a different perspective on the human phenomenon. Because to me, what blew my mind from the beginning of my intellectual journey was just seeing how it's like a thought experiment of when you think about how things unfold on physical time, when you think about how things unfold in chemical time, biological time, it, it seems like we're dramatically out of place in the cosmos because culturally speaking and technologically speaking even more so, things happen just so quickly. So this is where in the first lecture we talked about accelerationism. But, you know, to give like an example, like, so this thought experiment is one I ran way back and it's sort of been a really powerful one for me. And, and I don't see, never really heard this thought experiment run anywhere else, so I'll share it. Um, which is that like, when you think about evolution biologically, so this is just where we picked up from last time. When you think about evolution biologically, with our theories of biology, you could predict, say, 10 million years into the future, that, like, take chimpanzees, I'm just going to give three examples, like chimpanzees, lions, and dolphins, right? 
Now, using our evolutionary theory that we know, we can't predict exactly what those forms will look like 10 million years into the future, obviously. We won't know what the descendants of contemporary chimpanzees, lions, and dolphins will look like, but we could pretty realistically predict that they'll have, they'll look something like a chimpanzee, a dolphin, or a lion. But when it comes to, say, human civilization, and you ask the question, so this is the thought experiment. If you ask the question, what will human civilization look like in 10 million years? It's an impossible thing to answer. It doesn't even make sense. When you think about a human civilization, of course, human civilization is operating here. Obviously, we're still biological, but like the real change is occurring here. Like when you think about the longest lived civilizations, China, Egypt, Rome, these civilizations lasted at most 5,000 years. Like it, it doesn't compute to ask, like what would China look like over a 10 million year time span? All right, so I'm just trying to get at that there's this really strange way in which we don't fit when situated in the context of a cosmic evolutionary way of thinking. And also to presence, that a cosmic evolutionary way of thinking is so new. Like, but people weren't thinking in those terms, couldn't have thought in those terms 150 years ago. Just that even way of thinking wouldn't have computed. It, it was totally antithetical to, say, Newtonian physics and, and, and that way of thinking. So there's this way in which we're kind of strangely out of place. And, and, and then like in the room up there, there's someone talking about Bayesian statistics and Bayesian predictability. And, and, and super interesting stuff. But at least when I was first getting into science, what blew me away was the, just the way in which scientific predictability breaks down. Uh, again, and the, the closer you get to human civilization, like making meaningful predictions about what's going to happen 100, 500, 1,000 years from now doesn't make sense for human civilization, really. Uh, but like the strange thing is like we kind of know what the sun is going to be doing five billion years from now, right? We kind of know what the Andromeda galaxy is going to be doing billions of years into the future. So there's a way in which prediction totally breaks down when you get into the complexity of the human civilization in a really deep way. And even with like the Bayesian probability statistics, like that guy was showing us a website where you could go on and predict and, and I think that that website looked like a really useful tool for um, overcoming sensationalist news dynamics like he was emphasizing. But at the same time, like, you know, you're really limited with, with prediction man. So it's, it's, it's just a way in which prediction totally breaks down and the strangeness of our phenomena, the strangeness of the phenomena of the human species. Um, very quickly, I just want to get into I think that when you think about this process, now someone correct me if you think I'm wrong on this, but when you think about this as one process, I think you have to think about how with physics and chemistry, there's developmental change, stars develop, galaxies develop, there's even generational change, stars have generational cycles, for example. But there's nothing like natural selection operating here. And even natural selection is seen to be the key distinction between chemistry and biology. Like natural selection is a mechanism that, that can only start working when you have, let's say, autopoetic living phenomena, self-referential phenomena that create a boundary with themselves. So there's a weird way in which natural selection starts there. And even like biologists, right? Like, Biologists and chemists still haven't really figured out how this transition takes place. It's called a, I'm sure everyone knows here, abiogenesis. Now, when it comes to biology and culture, I think what's underthought and understudied, under theorized is, is there a different type of evolutionary process? Is there, like, if, if there's a qualitative change, between the form of evolution that's going on with physical chemical processes and biological processes? Is there a qualitative change in biological evolution to cultural and technological evolution? 
In my thesis, I propose the idea that what's kind of going on with cultural and technological evolution is that there's a kind of inversion of natural selection where there's a more conscious or intelligent selection process that doesn't require our bodies to die. Right? Because in natural selection, biology, in order for real change to occur, the bodies themselves need to, need to pass away. But with culture and technological evolution, and like even this is the, so like basically there's a type of, I don't know if this is the right term to use, but there's a type of, now Darwin would call this artificial selection. And he did call it artificial selection. So there's a type of, even with what Darwin's talking about, I wanted to get, I feel like something deeper with uh, an intelligent selection process, where basically what I'm trying to go for here is that there's a type of real-time natural selection going on with intelligent selection. And I think even like the phenomenon of a conference like this is kind of like a real-time selection where you, you, know, you, you choose which room to go to and you choose which person to listen to and you either negate or affirm that person's ideas, right? Like you're filtering through like, is this guy talking nonsense or is this guy telling me information that I could carry on and, and continue working with, right? There's a type of real-time selection of crucial thing. And the material is different, ideas. And of course, someone like Richard Dawkins would call this needs. So there's a type of mental selection going on. There's a type of ideational selection going on, which I think accounts for why evolution speeds up so quickly. And, and then in the context of the technological medium within which we exist now, that evolutionary process can get even faster because the way, like how quickly we can share ideas with each other, basically the pool of ideas or the pool of memes increases. Like a good example of that was in a presentation from the guy who was doing the mindfulness and meditation presentation where he's comparing all of the different world religions. But like the way he's comparing all those different world religions, it would have been very difficult to do that a thousand years ago. It would have been very difficult to do that. It would have been impossible to do that 2,000 years ago, right? Because you wouldn't have had a global sample of world religions. Now you have a, not only do you have a global sample of world religions, but you can actually expose yourself to active practitioners of all world religions, right? Like you wouldn't have been able to do that 100 years ago, really. It would have been very difficult. Well, it, very, a very small number of people would have been able to do that. It would have taken an enormous amount of time and energy to do that. It would have been a life's work to do that. Now you can kind of do it in a hyper condensed timeline. Like you can do it almost immediately. You just want to go on Wikipedia and spend your day reading about all world religions. And then if you really want to take a month or a year to expose yourself to all the different active practitioners, of those, you could in principle do that. Everyone could. And people are doing that. They're experimenting and exposing themselves. So I'm just saying that there's, this process is, is massively accelerating, is the main point. And that this is an interesting way to contextualize our present moment, again, with technological complexification and socio-political convergence. And now that's interesting to think about religiously, you know, people in the West actively experimenting with Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism, people in the East, like, like if you go to Korea, you'll find Anglican churches there, right? Like, like there, there are, like, so there's just this huge cross-pollination, religiously speaking, uh, but it's even, I think, more important and even more interesting to think about that politically, because, and, and this, because this is where we get into the potential threat of, of war, and I think we are, uh, heading back into serious geopolitical tensions. Like, we shouldn't forget, and I think our generation, it's easy for us not to be aware that in the 20th century, there was constant geopolitical tension. Constant. And constant threat of major world war was in the 20th century. And like, but our generation's kind of like uh, ignorant of it because when we didn't experience it, we didn't live through it. But I think that's returning now, these geopolitical tensions. I think the, the let's say, the neoliberal, like Francis, who knows Francis Fukuyama's thesis about the end of history. The idea that the end of history is like the neoliberal form of secular democracy uh, after the Cold War. We just have neoliberal secular democracy, and that's just going to spread everywhere. 
I think that thesis has been debunked. I don't think that's, that you know, China is not a neoliberal secular democracy. Russia is certainly not a neoliberal secular doc democracy. There are different, well, my point is, there are really, there are real differences in political form, real differences. And those differences could lead to geopolitical tensions and are at the moment, like Russia, Ukraine, for example, is an example of it. Of course, what's going on in Palestine and, and Israel, basically have an ethno state there. So I'm saying that because of technological complexification and socio-political convergence, these political differences are going to be forefronted. We need to think them theoretically. We need to think the theory of different political systems and the consequence of those political systems for the global whole. And hopefully we'll be able to get in to some of that stuff. But first I want to, uh, before going on to the next section, I just want to make uh, a point about like what I think the ultimate meaning of uh, this, this thinking is, which is basically something that I think Wolfram presenced in his presentation about entropy and the tendency towards randomness, the tendency towards, let's say, heat death in a cosmological term. If you're just thinking in a reductionist physics way, of course, Wolfram's thinking about computational irreducibility, what cannot be reduced. To computation, but if you're just thinking in a reductionist way, just base level physics, you, the, the, the tendency seems to be that thermodynamics leads to the heat death of the universe. That's what most people currently think now. So basically, you're going towards randomness. If they, if they, now, over an unimaginable amount of time, it's not like it's an imminent problem, but it's like that's like the, the ultimate truth of the evolutionary processes. It's like it's just going to go to nothing, basically. What does nothing mean? But so, but then the mystery is, if you think in these terms, then the question immediately comes, and there are people who think about this, but like, what is the cosmic significance, is there, what is the cosmic significance of these processes? Because these are massively non-random processes, they're processes driven by intelligence, and what are the consequences of these processes for the cosmos? It's just a very speculative, open question. Uh, funny, in a recent interview with Elon Musk, uh, Jordan Peterson, who knows Jordan, Jordan Peterson? Most people. So Jordan Peterson just did an interview with Elon Musk, where Elon Musk says, entropy is the ultimate boss battle, right? Like, so he's, he's using a computational metaphor, it's like we're in a video game, and, and entropy is the end boss, you know? So like, you think end boss, everything's going to nothing. And he, what's Elon Musk doing? He's a technologist. He's using technology to do improbable things, massively improbable things, things that could not basically happen at random. They can only happen through uh, intelligence, right? So I'm saying we've got technologists thinking about entropy as a video game boss battle with the end of the universe being nothing versus this very strange process that's emerged and basically we don't know uh, we cannot, and here's the, I think this is why we can't predict. We can't predict, because these things depend on creativity. And I think creativity is, like, it wouldn't be creativity if you could predict it. <laughs> like, it, 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 would, it would destroy the concept of creativity. Creativity is, and, 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 he, and, and Wolfram brought this up in relationship to uh, computational irreducibility. He said, with computational irre irreducibility, we come to undecidability which is basically in the history of philosophy, choice, decision, all of that is very close to freedom, right? So these processes, this process, intelligent selection as a difference, biology, I don't think biological life forms are free or creative. <laughs> I don't think they are. I think freedom and creativity emerges as a weird tension with culture and technology and that that's what's really driving these processes, and these processes are now accelerating, and, and we have to be able to, to, to think about these, these things. Um, and I think our culture here, history of this, now moving on, I think that's like the stakes of this type of thinking. History of the future, super interesting, because I think our culture on a broad paradigmatic scale uh, is, is trying to accommodate this reality. Slowly, surely, but, but trying to accommodate this, this reality. I think there are a few key breaks 
historically speaking, where we've tried to more and more accommodate ourselves to this reality, politically speaking, socially speaking. The main distinction is, I think, there are a few, and it can get messy, so I don't want to... I am oversimplifying a little bit just for the sake of time and for the sake of communication. What we tend to call pre-modern or ancient. Ancient is probably a better term because there's no one, I guess it's, it's, it's semantics. And the modern. But then you can further ask yourself, well, what is the distinction between the pre-modern and the modern? Like, what's going on here between the pre-modern and the modern? There's a few different meaningful distinctions here. One of the major features of the ancient or the pre-modern worldview is a kind of cyclical view. It's a cyclical view, meaning that uh, what happened last year is going to happen next year, right? Uh, and and this, is, this is, now, this metaphysics, is deeply synergistic with hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and it's deeply synergistic with an agricultural lifestyle. Because you're paying attention to the cycles of the seasons, you're paying attention to the cycles of nature, and nature and the seasons in your lifetime don't seem to change fundamentally. Like, they're the same. Like, they were the same when I was born, they're the same when I die, they're the same for my grandfather, they'll be the same for me when I'm a grandfather. There's a type of cyclical view, which means basically, I think, that when you encounter a cyclical metaphysics, what usually happens is that the notion of a higher future, the notion that the world could be better, the notion that the world could be fucking fantastic, the notion that the world could be like heaven, right? Some sort of heavenly, beautiful, um, cosmically significant space usually gets projected into the afterlife, right? So you have this notion of the afterlife, that when I die, I'm going to go towards some afterlife. And I think the notion of the afterlife here as a better place I'm going to go after I'm dead comes out of the fact that, well, if this reality I'm in is just this cyclical loop that's just the same forever, and there's no way we can make a meaningful intervention of it to change reality significantly, uh, it comes as like sort of a natural coping mechanism in some ways. With modernity, and I think this happens in phases, but with modernity, the circle really gets broken. What I mean by the circle gets broken is that there's a notion on many different levels. I think this happens religiously. I think this happens scientifically. I think this happens politically. And let's say, for convenience sake, for simplicity's sake, let's use those three distinctions to show what does it mean to think in a modern way, religiously, politically, scientifically? What does that mean? Religious political, scientific. Now, super biased here, you could say Western-centric, you could say, yeah, you could just say a biased Western-centric point of view. But I think with the Abrahamic traditions, there is something different from the Eastern traditions when it comes to this. Because the Eastern traditions do tend to have a cyclical notion, like in Buddhism you have the wheel of life, and the point is to reach nirvana, and then once you've reached nirvana, the point is to help other people reach nirvana, but there's just this, there's the big wheel and the little wheel. Uh, and then even with the, the person who was presenting on mindfulness and meditation, he was saying Brahma is just this everything, it's like a big circle. There's this notion, I think in most Eastern religions, what you get is a circle, and in most Western pagan religions, you get a circle as well. So it's not anything essential or special about Western culture, but something with Abrahamic traditions represents a break. In Christianity, most famously, the break is Christ. It's a historical break, and the historical break points to a before and an after that's irreversible. And I'm not saying, I'm not, I do not care about the literal truth claims of the religion, but I'm saying that there is a break in thinking in the human species embedded in our civilizational processes between the past and the future, which points towards a future which is different than the past. 
right? In Christianity, what is it? It's the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ is pointing towards the second coming, where Christ is going to come back and we're all going to go up to heaven. That way of thinking, religiously speaking, is pointing towards that the future is going to be different than the past, and that fucks us up psychologically, and that's why you get in Christianity, but also in Judaism and Islam, people proselytizing about the end times, people proselytizing about Christ is coming back. <laughs> that doesn't happen before this break. You don't get people proselytizing about the end times, because time's not going to fucking end. It's just going to go on in a circle forever. But there's a break. There's a break between the past and the future. Historical, t I think the main difference between the pre-modern and the modern is that time itself and the irreversibility of time and this movement towards a future in which we are active participants in, in Christian terms, it's you're kind of morally, like your moral behavior uh, is, is part of this process that is going to impact the future. And this has concrete consequences, like the most famous sociologist of the 19th century, Max Weber, uh, wrote a thesis, very famous thesis, still mostly accepted today, that the Protestant spirit, the Protestant work ethic, contributed to the emergence of capitalism, was indispensable to the emergence of capitalism. And if that thesis is true, then because the whole planet is now capitalist, the whole spirit is kind of, the whole planet is kind of smuggled in the Protestant work ethic, you know? <laughs> it's like smuggled that spirit into capitalism because capitalism needs that work ethic. If you don't have that work ethic, you don't have capitalism. So that's, that's, that's one thing. And, 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 and the t what, what does that mean? The type, of, the type of person that's operating in this way is they're constantly saving for the future. They're being very frugal, and this emerges in Judaism very frugal, working hard, and delaying gratification towards the next generation, towards the future, so the future can be better, so the future can be better than it is now. That whole notion of thinking that the future can be better than it is now is deeply ingrained in us, and we're really upset now if it's not. And I think there's a lot of political disturbance today because gen millennials do not have a materially better life than the boomers. So there's a lot of generational frustration with the boomers because the millennials are like, we're getting a raw deal here. We're getting a cheap deal here. You didn't sacrifice for us so that our, our world would be better than your world, right? So, so, so I'm saying this is deep in us now. Like it's, 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 we're, we're not happy if this isn't happening. Um, but in the pre-modern cyclical worldview, you wouldn't have that expectation. Yeah. Judgment yeah, yeah. Rational, yeah, yeah, exactly. In, in pre modern times, though, you did have like ancient civilizations which believed in some kind of judgment day or some kind of end times. Could you give an example? Uh, like, I think there was, I, I can't remember, I think I think it might have been the Indus Valley where a civilization or it might have been somewhere rather that they believed in like, the great flood, essentially. Or like, even even in biblical times. Yeah. But like it's it's kind of a common theme that eventually there will be some kind of end of time and a new world. I I but think. Do you get what you mean? Yeah. The, the concept of life was much more circular and much more cyclical. Yeah. That even though there is there are great changes, the world kind of continues in the same way. Now those those flood myths, for example, like I, I here's a hypothesis. I don't know if it's true. The hypothesis would be that when human civilization started encountering major natural catastrophes, which had no historical parallel, yeah. those natural catastrophes could get built into myths that were pointing towards a larger metaphysical structure, which ultimately do get incorporated into the Abrahamic traditions, like the flood, like Noah. Uh, but I then, like, but, Ameto, Ameto can be as well. Ameto went to the earth, uh, sorry, very big crisis. If Ameto in the Ashram time. Okay. Asteroid? Yeah, asteroid. Yeah. Well, there was no major asteroid impact in ancient times for humans. I don't think. Like, in what, I mean, when Jesus Christ was more, was when? Well, was different? Was only a star, a star, but you see something new on the, on the sky? Uh, what was that? 
So that, that, that does have an interesting history, but because like an asteroid never hit the Earth in ancient times, like it never got in, incorporated into our mythologies, but the prediction of asteroids in the sky was crucial for the legitimization of science because scientists were able to predict those asteroid movements in ways that like fortune tellers and like mystics were unable to predict them. So it gave like science like a type of predictive power that like other forms of knowledge didn't have, which is interesting. Now, what about the earthquakes? Earth earthquakes? I think that, again, like this might be going a little too, too far afield, but my hypothesis would be that major natural catastrophes that happened only rarely in terms of generational time uh, would probably get interpreted in t some sort of mythological story or some sort of mythological structure. But I think the key thing about what's going on with the Abrahamic religions is that we're talking about the entire historical process and, and I don't know if even with the flood myths they were presupposing that the flood would end the entire human historical process, uh, but that it might be interpreted as some sort of uh, mythological cleansing, which is how the flood gets interpreted. Yeah. Like the flood is interpreted as a cleansing. Like we're being bad, we're being immoral, we're being unethical. So God's going to send a flood, not to end all of history, but to cleanse all the rabble away so that we can start fresh. So those types of stories ultimately do get built in with the Abrahamic traditions into some sort of mega historical theory of the future being really different than the past. That's really what I want to communicate, is the idea starts to appear that the future is going to be really different than the past. And now this gets a big significant change politically and scientifically speaking with just make sure I'm not missing anything. Basically, what we call the scientific revolution. Like if you look at, it's interesting to read the metaphysics of people who were writing during the scientific revolution. Like even like guys like Newton and Descartes, I don't know, yesterday there was a guy here who, I did, a, who did a really great presentation arguing that Newton and Descartes materialist scientific metaphysics is inadequate to our present moment. We need to update it with other thinkers, more poetic, more living, blah, blah, blah. But if you read Newton and Descartes metaphysics, not their science, like they're crazy, like they're mystical, insane, like, like Newton's insane, like, like New, New, Newton is thinking about, like Newton is thinking in Christ, Christ theological terms, like Newton always said, oh, Newton's a reductionist materialist who thinks it's a deterministic clockwork. But he's also thinking in Christ theological terms in his metaphysical thinking. He thinks that the future is going to be really different than the past. So he can't get away from the theological substructure already being quasi-modern in a sense. But the scientific revolution also does represent a scientific approach to this underlying metaphysics which is that the future is going to be really different than the past. The big difference is, it's that it's no longer a matter of our moral standing with God in science. It's about, let's use reason and technology, and we can make the future better than the past. But let, let, let's use reason and, and, and technology, right? And the idea there, and so I think this is like, the, this is where like the distinction between traditional Christianity and Gnostic Christianity means a lot. Because if you use reason and technology to think now we can escape biological reality, now we can escape reality, that would be a Gnostic approach of science. That would be a Gnostic use of science because the Gnostics want to escape the body. They don't like the body. They don't want to get away from the body, right? So you can use it in a Gnostic way. Or I don't know what the other best word to call it would be, but you can use it in a way that I would call reconciliation. where you reconcile with material reality, but you reconcile with the material reality that's constantly improving because of reason and technology. And there are many people, many current scientific thinkers who, who, who think like this, who, who you use this. Let's, that, that reality is much better today than it was 100 years ago, that reality is much better than it was 500 years ago because of this, so let's keep doing this, right? Uh, and, and, and whether you want, are ultimately doing it to escape the body or whether you're doing it just to reconcile with the body in reality is another question. 
Politically speaking, it really happens with things like the American Revolution and the French Revolution as significant turning points, politically speaking, in terms of we don't have to labor under monarchies, because monarchies are like this. Like, the monarch is just a perpetual power center that is always going to exist and it's going to be perpetuated through the generations. The whole importance of the transition from monarchy to liberal democracy, that's the transition. Monarchy to liberal democracy. Which is all interrelated. These are all interrelated. These are all connected. To liberal democracy. Now, the crucial thing with liberal democracy, and this is super important to know of the health of a democracy, because the point of liberal democracy is that we can do transitions of power without killing people. That's the point of liberal democracy. So what does that mean? It means if the presidents and the prime ministers are getting shot at, it means things are not going so well. It means your liberal democracy is not really working. <laughs> because if your liberal democracy is working, what it will do well is allow transitions of power to occur without killing each other, right? There's something I'm not uh, understanding, I think. Sure. This transition between pre-modern and modern. Yeah. Where do you put it in time? Because so I think it happens, it's not one event, I don't think. Okay. I think it's a series of cuts. I think it happens, religiously speaking, perhaps even 2,000 years ago. And the key thing is, that we cannot understand, we cannot understand, and this is, there's some controversial things here. So let me say, they'll say, say, I'll say the controversial things, is that who's read Edward Said's Orientalism? Edward Said Orientalism, you have. So Edward Said's thesis in Orientalism is that the whole idea of Asia, the whole idea of Africa are Western constructs. Like Asia and Africa didn't exist before Europeans started the colonization process. What that means is, is that people in what we call India today did not conceive of themselves as Indian. They conceive of themselves as Indian in reaction to there's a colonial force here. It's even possible that there was no such thing as Hinduism. Hinduism seems to be a mix and a mash of different spiritual traditions that have some sort of cultural similarity through the fact that they were all operating in the same region. But Hinduism could itself be a reaction formation to the appearance of a group of people who all called themselves Christian, right? And this happened even internal to Christianity because Europe considered itself Christian only in reaction to the fact that Islam started to move around the Mediterranean. We better start organizing ourselves against this world. All right, so, so my point here is just to say um, that the way we currently think about religion could have been an invention that only goes back 2,000 years. What Christians usually call pre-Christians are pagans and the spiritual pagan, pagan religion. Uh, it's kind of more like spirituality. But the idea is that there's, there's some break that's occurring here uh, that might, we could trace it back to 2,000 years. And there's a, and here's the most important thing, is that Christianity cannot be understood, and this is the point I want to ultimately say, that Christianity cannot be understood independently of its relationship to Rome as a historical entity. Christianity would not have existed ever if it wasn't for a certain political reaction to Rome and the morals and the ethics of Rome. Christianity was a weird corrective to the morals and ethics of Rome from the point of view of Christians, right? So we have to understand Christianity in that context. You can't understand Catholicism outside of that context uh, because Catholicism is fundamentally linked to its position of power in, in, in Italy, in Rome, in what was Rome, um, and so forth. Now, a lot of people think that that metaphysical substructure created the conditions of possibility for science to happen. We could go into that, why? And ultimately, for that effect to trickle into politics as well. 
But these are all breaks in modernity. I think the crucial one is like when we're like really in modernity, it's like when the political thing happens. Like that's the most common. If you look up the historical literature, this is what is seen as modernity. Because this is where our whole socio-political process is on board with this past-future distinction where through liberal, we're not only through science, because you could have science in a monarchical government, right? But it's when science is embedded in a liberal democracy, that's sort of seen as like, okay, we've got all of the dimensions we need for the modern process to unfold, where we're going into a future that's better because of a certain sacrificial ethics, because of reason and technology, because of democracy, right? So like, that's like the sweet kind of, like you have sacrificial ethics, you have reason and technology, and you have democracy. And when you have all of that together, that's te technically what you could see as what you, what you, this is what, when people refer to, when people refer to enlightenment, that's what they're referring to. Now, enlightenment, just one sec, enlightenment in the, in the last 200 years has been our main cultural operating system. But even that's under threat now. And it's not even clear that enlightenment is correct. Right? So the, enlightenment does not mean, now enlightenment not be the best term. But in my view, enlightenment does not mean completion. Enlightenment does not mean perfection. Enlightenment does not mean that the process is over or that we aren't going to have to make significant updates. I think that we're going to have to make significant updates to all of these things. Right? But for the last 200 years, this is what we've been working with, so to speak. But there, the, history is not over. History is not over. There's going to be significant breaks. Like, and that's the thing that I think we need to wake up to in the 21st century is that there are going to be breaks. There are going to be wars. There are going to be religious struggles. There are going to be scientific discoveries that change the way we think about everything. And, and I think that's really the point of what I'm trying to do with this thesis, is I'm trying to give this thesis in the idea that we need to prepare in some ways for the impossible. But I think that that gives us an advantage because I don't think that like when these fundamental changes were going on, I don't think the people who were undergoing these transformations were as reflectively as aware of what reality is as we could possibly be. And I think that's, that's, that's the effort here. Um, so what are we Cannot we uh, I, uh, pinpoint the start of this process a little bit earlier in the Maybe. emergence of early states, or stable states actually, yep. in the fertile crescent, Absolutely. where you have, you know, um, like in contrast to some state of nomadism, where you have to be very close to circles and adapt yep. both in order to survive, you have like uh, agriculturists, you have grains basically, which are dry and you can store them, you can centralize them. And I'm wondering if how is uh, this process of the break and yep. this line, this continuous line that goes up, are related to centralization of resources? And that, Fotis, is the perfect <laughs> segue yeah. into the next, what I want to talk about next. So that's really concluded. What Fotis is just mentioning is the perfect segue to what I want to talk about next. <laughs> so this is the idea in the thesis called the meta-system transition. And the meta-system transition is this idea that there are not just quantitative, but qualitative changes, historically speaking. And we can understand, I think, the meta-system dynamics of these changes that could give us a different reflective capacity to understand that we might be living through a meta-system transition now. We might be living through a meta-system transition in the 21st century. So the first meta-system, I think, is the hunter-gatherer organization. The second is the agricultural system. And I think what Fotis is bringing up is like, you're saying that this transition to what we call modernity is happening right here. The seeds of it are happening right here with the emergence of stable states. Yeah, and I think that's fair. 
I think that's I think that's totally fair. That and and so like this would this would co co corroborate with a thesis that I like that Slavoj Žižek presented in relationship to Bruno Latour with his idea. Bruno Latour's thesis is that um, uh, we were never modern, and Slavoj Žižek's thesis is we were always modern. So this would co corroborate here that as soon as we transition to agriculture, we're modern. We were always modern. Right, so that would be that would be the idea. So then you would see the seed of these occurring already with agriculture, which I think was already pointed at by by yourself, where these types of myths about a fundamental break already you can find them in agricultural civilizations before Christianity, of course. So it, it can be realistic to say that the break is occurring here most fundamentally, and then it deepens. The break deepens in in, in these dimensions. Now, the third meta system is the industrial. And I'm going to put this as a question mark for now. But I just want to get at in the book, I have a theory of meta systems which operates with a theory of information, energy, and control. So this theory of information, energy, and control is basically you need a certain informational medium, a certain energy resource, and a certain control structure to stabilize a metasystem. The first one is language. So with hunter-gatherers, I did. there's a whole interesting distinction between great apes and hunter-gatherers in regards to the emergence of language, which allowed us to start hunting on a mass scale and cooking, which is, turns out to be really important for brain growth and for our development, historically speaking. But anyway, so the hunter-gatherer matrix is basically language, hunting and cooking, and bands and tribes. And bands and tribes are quantitatively larger groups than any great apes make. Great apes don't have the capacity to hold together the types of band and tribe numbers that humans are able to do. And this is where the anthropologist Robin Dunbar, who's heard about the anthropologist Robin Dunbar or Dunbar's number? You. So Dunbar's number is basically that we're evolutionarily predisposed towards being able to hold in our sort of social cognition about 150 connections. And this comes from our hunter-gatherer metasystem. Chimpanzees, for reference, can only hold group sizes of about 50. So that means when you go from our chimpanzee ancestors, which weren't chimpanzees, obviously, towards hunter-gatherer human organizations, what you're seeing is, is basically a tripling of group size. A tripling of group size. That tripling of group size is because of language, and it's because of cooking and hunting. Right? And then we have a new control organization. This all gets disturbed with agriculture. And with these metasystems, these are always violent transitions, by the way. Like when, a tra when, when there's a metasystem transition to another metasystem, like agricultural civilizations, like the most famous is probably like the way in which China and Rome saw the outside of their organization, like the wild Mongol hordes, <laughs> which were not properly civilized. Here you get the main distinction. In agricultural civilizations, they, car they start to call these guys barbarians, basically. It's just the most generic term. We're civilized, they're barbarians. Because we're in this system, and they're in this system. And this system is a threat to our system, and we've got to defend our system. What's different is you get writing, formalized writing. Of course, you have symbols. You have people painting on cave walls. But the first writing is actually for tax collection and tracking of agricultural resources. It's very practical. And then after it builds up a little bit, you have like an elite class that starts experimenting with mathematics and stories and writing that doesn't serve a direct utilitarian function. The energy resource is obviously agriculture. And then the control structure is, we tend to call them like early city states, uh, but then they grow into empires. Like the best examples are like China and Rome. Uh, and these are monsters. Like that's like Christianity conceives of Rome as a monster. Um, and and and, and you know, these are just massive organized. So you have a massive explosion in group size. You go from 150 people in a band or tribe towards the possibility of holding millions of people 
into a empire that is loosely connected through taxes and tariffs and different sort of observances of state authority. Then another big meta system transition is the industrial, where the, I think the information medium that made the industrial revolution possible is the printing press, because then you could take writing and you could replicate it. And then you have mass literature, you have ma that, well, you get the ground of the scientific revolution, basically, with the industrial, with the industrial printing press. And then you get the possibility of exploiting basically the history of the earth with industrial uh, energy, fossil fuels, what we call fossil fuels. And the control system that organizes around this is the nation state. Nation states didn't exist before this system. They are coextensive with it. They rise and fall with it. And so they might, like, they're historical, like nation states are not eternal. We think of them as eternal, even though they're actually quite recently constructed, like they're quite new things. And so if this is true, that you have the printing press, the energy of the industrial resources, and the nation state as the industrial meta system, you can already start to think, well, that system's breaking down, right? <laughs> What's challenging the printing press is all the new information mediums, predominantly the internet. Now there were a suite of other information technologies that were building up to the internet in the 20th century, but the internet is sort of like the, the, the culmination, the pinnacle of these processes. It's, it, and here in my theory anyway, so this has predictive power historically speaking, because I think the information medium always comes first. So, so information has a privilege here in this theory over at energy. And that's basically because of the, I think it's related to the intelligence selection. Because if you don't have the intelligence medium to deal with a new energy medium, you're not gonna harness, like the fossil fuels have been there forever. It's just been waiting for a new information medium that's capable of exploiting that resource, but it's been there, like the energy's been there. So you need the new information medium. I think we have the internet. Now the new energy system, I think we see that in contemporary political discourses with the tension between fossil fuels and renewable energies. Now, so that's why I'm saying we're in it. Like, cause it's, 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 it's the tensions here. Now I'm not saying renewables are gonna replace fossil fuels. It's not deterministic. I don't think the future is deterministic, but there's a tension here that's emerging in terms of how do we energetically power a civilization that's global? because this system is not global. That's the thing. The size of the spread of the system gets increasingly larger, all right? This system is not capable of hand handling globality. That's why, that's why this system has so much struggle with globality. Nation states, printing press technologies and, and uh, industrial technologies they're in some sense antithetical ecologically to a global civilization. That's why there's so much discourse about global warming. That's why there's so much discourse about ecological catastrophe, because they're saying, if we just let this system keep running, then we undermine our own civilizational foundation, right? So this system is not formed yet. My theory is, is that the information comes first and it's already here, the internet. So we have to use the internet to coordinate with each other in a different way than we ever have before, and we are doing that. But we need to establish a new energy base that's actually globally sustainable, is I guess what's commonly said in the literature, global sustainable civilization. There's telos and goal orientations towards having a globally sustainable civilization by 2050 or something like that. This is like, these are like explicitly stated goals by international organizations like the UN. Also interesting to ask this question because we're gonna come to the politics of all this. What are international organizations? Like we should think about this philosophically. What are they? We shouldn't presuppose we know what they are. They're not nation states, right? They don't function like nation states and they don't have the power that nation states have right now. Nation state power is fundamentally being challenged by the globality of capital because capital can move everywhere and nation states can't control it. Currently, international organizations don't have power to regulate capital. They're economically impotent. That's the interesting thing with international organizations. I think we're scared of international organizations. We're scared of what international organizations could be. I think the best example of an international organization that has an economic power is probably the European Union. 
because the European Union is also not a nation state. It's, if you look it up on Wikipedia, it's called a supranational entity. There are huge political issues with the European Union, especially when it comes to democracy and when it comes to finance capital. But I also think on the whole, the European Union's been a success and that we should continue reinventing it. Like my view on these things is that we should opt away from totally deconstructing things and move towards a constant renovation of things. And so the European Union should be constantly reinvented, but I think we're going to need things like the European Union and other supranational organizations to fill out this meta system in terms of control. And I think that the main challenge there is partially ecological, but I think it's primarily capitalistic, like in terms of what needs to be controlled. I think the ecological would take care of itself as long as we could control the capital. So basically, my hypothesis for the fourth meta system is that you've got internet, you've got some sort of new re renewable energy resource, which could be made possible through technological complexification. And I know like guys like Ray Kurzweil are like very optimistic about that. I would say too optimistic about it, but I still don't think it's impossible. And then we, then the big one is we need to think of new control structures. Okay. So, um, I can see like what I'm very interested in is in this whole picture. Yeah. Like, starting from the cosmological yeah. uh, side, um, like turnbacks, you know, where mm -hmm. you're reiterating, where you're going back to something very fundamental, like. I see uh, that the radical breaks, the radical meta system transitions evolutionaries. I mean, yeah, these are meta systems as well. All of them. Technology seems like it's getting back to physics, okay, to working with this kind of like more uh, new evolutionary potentials of misconstruction of agency through evolution to work with the physical substrate. And I can see also like how with the internet, with this kind of like distributed networks, commons, the what is what is the emergence of the commons? Like that's my that's the next. So again, again, we're, that's we're the next. Very, we're very uh, same. Yes, because that's yeah. because and that's the next paper in the thesis. Yeah. The next okay. the next paper in the thesis. So I go through meta systems. I I I bring us to the problem that's here. Right. Right. With the big one is the control of of the commons. Yeah. And then it goes into a paper called Global Commons in the Global Brain. And it's a political proposal mm. for commons. And I situate the idea of the commons as a political theoretical update. Remember yesterday, I said, well, you weren't there yesterday, but yesterday I said that political science has become too data driven and it's not enough theory. Like we need new political theory. <laughs> we need to think, it can't just be data. You can't just have a lot of information. You need to actually be able to like, like, in some sense, what I think we've lost with this over data driven, too much computer science, too much physical sciences, not enough social science, science is that we've lost contact with hard theory. Like, and realize that like theory is actually super fundamental. Like, but we need a theory of the commons and we have resources to do this. Like there's a good literature on this. Like even Eleanor Ostrom has developed, like she won a Nobel prize for her theory of the commons and stuff. It's pretty small scale, but like we need a global theory of the commons. Yeah. And there's, there's already su successful cases. Like I consider like, uh, like a neutral network infrastructures like the TCP AP. Like even if you have like geo blocked internet, you can still act, you need this underlying infrastructure to be able to access. So that's why I'm saying the information is the core. Yeah. Like, and then guys like you are like thinking about this in terms of distributed networks and like, I know block, like my thing is like, we need to get out of the mental, so this is my challenge to you. We need to get out of the thinking of these new technologies being antithetical to the, to the state. And we need to think about how these technologies could update the state. I think, I don't know if you think that's a bad idea, but just that the new e potential networks how could they be used in a positive way by structures like the European Union to get more control over, over finance capital, for example? I don't know if that's a good direction of thinking, but like, I think there needs to be, we need to think about how these technologies are interfacing with international organizations, basically to build a new layer of trust. 
and a new layer of relationality that's not possible on the level of nation-state organization. Like the big elephant in the room is like surveillance, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's like uh, the, what, uh, what, how the control structure can go wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, no control, no control structure will be perfect. No, all, even I like the theory that what politics is, is the management of things going wrong. But like it's good. It's like there was this documentary with Arnold Schwarzenegger where he goes through his entire career like as a weightlifter, as a movie star, and as a political actor. And then he's talking about his political career, and he said, "Like I just learned, what politics is is just never-ending confrontation with problems, and you just have to remain positive." But like he'd say, "Like what it is? I show up to work. At, I show up to work. I've got a hundred people coming to see me today from all different areas of the state." And they're going to come to me with their problems, and I can't solve them, and it's just going to happen every day. And that's what politics is. So, like, whatever control infrastructure is needed, it has to be more robust in terms of its capacity to deal with fundamental negativity. Because it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be ideal. There's always going to be negativity. There's always going to be major problems. And it's just, do you have a political system that can meaningfully respond to those problems? And is it robust enough to remain positive in the face of this onslaught of negativity and problems? Mm. But this is the challenge. And so like, here's the idea. And this is like, the, and this is where I guess I'll stop because it's been an hour. So that's fair. So like with the commons, I think we need to get, and the main point of the paper is we need to get away from like what was communistic thinking. So like there's a change from common from commune because communism was based on a commune. And I think this too much idealizes human nature. And I think it in, in some sense it obfuscates the way humans are biologically in terms of family building, community building. Like I don't want to live in a commune with my girlfriend. I'm not going to. I just want to live with my girlfriend and I'll interface with communities how I want to interface with communities. I don't want to be forced into a community where me and my girlfriend have to deal with all these other social dynamics, which are just going to over exhaust me, cognitively speaking. So I think we need to have a, and, and that goes back to like recognizing like the foundations of like the religious, which was the religious was like a foundational, sacrificial, ethical system. Right. I don't think we should get rid of it. I think we should just reconcile ourselves with it. But to go to the commons is that we need to think about what global political negativities require global coordination. I think that's the question. And I think the best example so far is like, and I'm using this as a case example, but coronavirus. So like coronavirus was an objective global negativity. It involved all human beings. And you saw that nation states responded to it super differently. Right. But it was a global negativity and how one nation state responds to it is going to affect how another nation state responds to it. And it's a, it's a common problem. So I think we need to think. And so in the paper, I go through different common problems, which is I think there are common problems that are ecological. Like global warming, climate change is a common problem. Technological. I, I would say the singularity is a, is a common problem, especially if we're dealing with the emergence of artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence will affect everyone, uh, but also automation. Automation is, is a potential common problem, especially if it seeps into all sectors, because all human beings and all labor will be affected by that. Uh, there are others, social, biological, like the biggest, like biological, like coronavirus is a biological example. It's kind of an ecological example as well. But like, what if we start doing genetic engineering on a mass scale? What if CRISPR technology is all of a sudden being used by states to design new humans or different types of humans? Well, all of a sudden, that's kind of a common problem. Because if you've got one nation state that's genetically designing babies and all the other states aren't genetically designing babies, then there's going to be a huge disparity on a biological level with these different types of humans. These are all commons problems. I go through lists of others in the, in, in the book, in, in that paper on the commons. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll close there. And that sort of like sets us up for the, the, for the final day tomorrow because we, we got through like a lot more than I anticipated we'd get through today.
All right, so welcome to the final uh, lecture. And thanks for everyone who's come to either most or, or, or some of these uh, lecture series. I haven't, I really don't think we'll be able to get through all four parts of Global Brain Singularity. Right now, where we're at is basically the first two parts. We've gone through the first two parts. Roughly, the four parts correspond to a temporal metaphor past, present, future, and then the fourth part is kind of like a meta-present reflection on time. And so, like I said, we won't be able to probably get to the fourth part, but I'm hoping we'll be able to get to speculations about the deep future. That's the, the hope of, of what I want to accomplish today. I will pick up a little bit where we left off yesterday because we just sort of briefly discussed it, and I actually think it connects really well to where we ended up in the interdisciplinary workshop that Fotis just led, specifically with the idea that the whole reason we're having the conversation about interdisciplinarity versus disciplinarity seemed to come down to a capitalistic production. Like, we're disciplinarity because we make more money that way. And, and even like one, one guy was saying, like, that's a broad, general, even he said absolute, uh, function that we all have to make money to 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 uh, to live in this society, and that connects really well to where we left off yesterday with the meta systems, and specifically the challenge of I think our current meta system, which is basically the control function of capital mobility. And if we don't deal with the control function, that would be my hypothesis. If we don't deal with the control function of capital mobility, we're going to become more and more reduced to capital. In an absolute way, like the, the guy said at the end of the uh, session. So, just discussing with just discussing with you, the meta system idea is that we've gone through four meta systems in human history. These meta systems, at least according to my thesis, if an assumption can be challenged is that metasystems work in a triad of information, energy, and control, with information being primordially the most important to get the new system going. So you have info, energy, control. And we went through the three task systems, where you have the first metasystem being language, hunting, and bands and tribes. On what? The control being bands and tribes. You have language. Language. And like, for example, in Wolfram's presentation, he talks about the emergence of the symbolic code, the emergence yeah. of symbolism. Should I say language? Language helps us to hunt and cook. This separates us from the primates. If you look at primatology, anthropology, what separates us and what expands our neocortex, there's a feedback loop going between hunting, cooking, and also larger band and tribe sizes. Like I said last time, they tripled. So chimpanzees can basically have a group size of 50. Gorillas, gorillas is smaller. Yeah. And they have totally different socio-sexual organizations, the great apes. But they, but, like, I, I, they are like born or they develop things to the other to the right. Look, we can have, like bands and tribes had larger group sizes because we had more energy and we had a better communication pathway because guess how chimpanzees do it yeah do you know no no I know. they groom each other they groom they groom I each know. other like yeah. who's messing with whose hair i've seen it right that's how you know who fucks with who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right like who, who's messing with who uh -huh. right with us it's it's language like mm. we, we speak to each other. But that's a way of language. That's yeah. a way of grooming. Absolutely. Grooming is absolutely. Absolutely. You know? absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but this is in and, your thesis, or do you, yeah, so this is in uh, the, do you get from an author that you can share with us? Like, um, oh, there's many. Like you go into the anthropological literature. The most famous one is Rob, Robin Dunbar. So if you look up Robin Dunbar, he's an anthropologist. Who, the, yeah. like, like the last name, sorry. Thank you. Dunbar. And the famous study, the, the famous idea is called Dunbar's number. Dunbar's. Dunbar's number is basically that we are socially programmed from evolutionary of, I would say, the first meta system. Yes. We can hold about 150 social relationships. 150. But but cognitively, we're we're not very good at holding more than that, which is 
very disorienting to be in an information medium where you're basically connected to millions and billions of people. So you're you're short circuiting that that that. It may be a side question a bit, but like with this Dunbar number, I will always always wonder it's about the average, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the distribution around the average? Because there are different people, you know, and like something like one. There's people. variation. Yeah, but it sounds like I don't know. It doesn't arbitrary. Yeah, very much. Well, I just I would encourage you to look in the literature and make your own determination about it. This lecture isn't specifically about the Dunbar number, but that is a that is a well well known. I'm just using it as a proxy for uh, when you do look at the anthropological literature of in the 19th century and in the early 20th century when anthropologists are studying what was still remaining of hunter gatherer tribes. Their size, their tribe size. So, so, okay, so they say the limit is not the energy, not information. It's a, it's a control in mind, like what we got to do, like limit of it. It's basically mind. like group identification. So, like the hypothesis would be, let's say Semp grows. Let's say Semp grows as an organization. You could say Semp as a band or a tribe could meaningfully scale. Let's say up to 150 active participants. But if it became a thousand active participants you would need a qualitatively different control system to like meaningfully organize SEM. And so like there's like a qualitative transition that would occur. Yeah, reason uh, like, transforms. Like a university, you need a university. Yeah. Reason transforms itself uh, depending on the number of the people that compound the band. You know, mm -hmm. like when you are talking to less people, you are more, you are more, um, reasonable uh -huh. and when you are talking to a really high it becomes difficult of person and you, it becomes it's like a good point emotional you know it only it's emotional. a really important point because this is like i was always born like when i was five or six years old yeah. one of my first early intellectual thoughts was the president or the prime minister must be the most rational smartest guy on the planet <laughs> right and then i grow up and i'm like well, we have Donald Trump, yeah. right? And it's like, what's going on here, right? So, and, and this is like the origin of like philosophy because at, at Plato's philosophy, he's like, he's saying like, we should organize our society with philosopher kings. That would be a good idea. That never works out. <laughs> it's always a catastrophe. So yeah. there's a way in which the emotion, like the, the basically vibing and connecting and organizing with let's say 300 million people, like uh, the United States, it's too much. We're not caught, but it's, it is much in. Um, well, that's why we have modern science. You know, it is. So, industry, and then we have this is the question. So, agriculture. We. I just want to go through this quickly as a recap, so we're all on the same page here. So, you have for agriculture, you have writing, agriculture, and what we would originally call city states, and then those city states become organized into empires. Rome and China being the biggest examples in ancient history of empires. Incas, Aztecs, also same thing going on there. Then industry. Industry, I think, was being mediated by the printing press, where you could start replicating writing. Uh, fossil fuels, we start to mine the resources of the planet. And nation states. And we're obviously still in a system that's predominantly dominated by nation states, but I just want to emphasize that the way we spontaneously think about nation states is like, they've been here forever, they're eternal. Like, no, they're not. They're temporal and they're very recent. And, 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 uh, and we already see their potential successors. If not their successors, something that is required more than nation states. Where did this come? Nation states in the early 19th century did not span the entire planet in the 19th century, they came to cover the whole planet. Why did we need something more than nation states? Because the nation states were in world wars. So what did we do? We had the League of Nations. We formed other organizations than the United Nations. We formed international organizations, which are, for the most part, politically, economically impotent. But that's because we're not really in the next system. We're not in the next system yet. We're just remind me uh, very quickly. Yeah. Agriculture will be like um, writing, agriculture, and city states. City states. Yeah, okay. like mostly like That's if you like if you read for example. Feel that? Absolutely. So if we go to yeah. the political economic okay. organizations, so like if we go into Marxist, 
right? And, and we go into Marxist, right? So Marx has a historical materialist dialectic of work, yeah. basically. That's what it's about. Uh -huh. So he thinks, now, if you go to like Greece and ancient Rome, it's running on slavery. So then you have feudalism. You have feudal lords with land, like, and so you're working the land. You get a free place to sleep because you're working the land. The person who's owning the land really controls everything, right? Then you have capitalism, right? And capitalism, this is interesting. Like, capitalism's always existed in a way. It's just that it wasn't the dominant system. And even people who, basically, it's the market was really limited. And, pe and if you worked on the market, you were seen as low. Like, you didn't have stats. Yes. Like, it was seen as, as, as low work, <laughs> shitty work. Now, if you're a CEO, if you're running a company, if you're like billionaire, corporate, now you like you're the man. Like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, like you're 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 the you're the dude. You you you're you're killing it, right? So capitalism market dynamics are dominant now, right? So it's and so and it's not that feudalism and slavery don't exist anymore. They still do. It's just not dominant anymore, right? It's not like. Like, for example, at the origin of America, slavery was explicit, wasn't hidden, everything is running on slavery, kind of, right? So it's still there. It's just that we, we now we've, we, we don't, export we, we, expo we export it. We absolutely <laughs> export it. Like, we have iPhones because of slave labor in the Congo and so forth, right? Like, we, 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 Let's, let's put it somewhere where we can't see it. Let's, <laughs> exactly. right? And let's not think about it too much. Let's only go to Africa if we're doing like volunteer work with... <laughs> like, the good system a, is hiding, um, hiding. In, the, in the stores, you know? The, the shows of the stores, the stores that sell you things. So they, the idea though is that Marxist dialectic would lead to socialism uh -huh. and then and then communism. And of course, when we move towards systems in the 20th century that are communistic, now that word has so many negative connotations now, right? Because of the catastrophes of the 20th century. But the origin of that word obviously had a very positive connotation. People were excited about the idea that we could live in a higher order community environment where we weren't reduced to capital. Which brings me back to the end of the presentation that Fotis was giving where we're reduced to capital. So it's in the feeling, the existential life history experience of being reduced to capital, where you see the germs in political theory of socialism, where there's a space where you can exist, which is not reduced to market dynamics, and where market dynamics are once again not eliminated, but put in their proper place, where you're not, where all scientific work, like how horrible would that be? Like all scientific work at the end of the day can be reduced to, I gotta pay my rent. That, that, that's why I'm doing science. No one gets into science for that reason. I got into science because I was amazed at wonder of nature, human condition. That's why you get into science. But if at the end of the day, so you spend 10 years going through the academic system and you see at every level of the academic system, it's getting harder and harder to make it. And there's fewer and fewer positions and the relationships with other people are more and more reduced to this competition. At the end of the day, people are just doing it because they can make money doing it or they leave and they do something else. And so all the wonder, all the joy is taken out of it. So like, when I was growing up, I mean, the possibility of democratic socialism as a legitimate political paradigm that could limit capital and open up a different social landscape seemed like a realistic possibility. I was expecting, like I was expecting when I get older, democratic socialism will be stronger. That's what I was hoping. It's not the case. If anything, I like the theory that we've regressed a little bit that capitalism's come more and more to dominate on an international level, and actually that puts us in more feudal situations where the land that we're slaving on is more and more in the realm of digital technical, technical empire, right? So the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles, the YouTubes, all of these things are like feudal platforms. 
right? And, 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 and the reason why they're kind of like feudal platforms is because they have no nation state can really control and regulate these things. They're international, and it's just like a wild, wild west free market capitalism, which is reducing to its, its basic uh, co common denominator, which is to make billions of dollars for the people who own those platforms. And more and more, they don't need that many workers. <laughs> like, it's, like, if you compare, there's a really good analysis of like, the difference between like, Kodak and Instagram. Like Kodak in the 1990s, they needed tons of workers. Instagram needs no workers, like very few, and they can make billions, right? Facebook needs not many work, like increasingly, and so this is why Marxist theory is increasingly not only relevant, but also problematic, because the entire dynamic that Marx is articulating of a proletariat class, a working class consciousness, it, it, it's not really realistic. We don't see ourselves as a unified working class. Really, the whole Marxist theory has to be understood internal to the origin of this metacity. Because what is the class consciousness that Marx is talking about is an industrial working class consciousness. That's, he's not talking about the information. We're in the information. He's talking about the industrial. So the theory is out of date in, in a deep way. And that's why I keep emphasizing throughout this talk, in these talks, is that we need the return of political theory. Political theory is important. And I think that this system, thinking in terms of this meta system, is a good way to start thinking about political theory again. Because I'm, I'm claiming that we're entering a new system, but it's Can not. Can you remember the so, language? So, so, the, so, the new, so the new system. Yes. No, no, in industry. Can you remember? Oh, in industry, it's printing press. Printing press, that, yeah. that's all. Fossil fuels and then nation states. But then that's breaking down now, because printing press is being challenged by the internet. Right? And if you think about that, like I'm actually using this theory to build my, I, I, I run an education platform called philosophyportal.online. I built that because I recognize that the university system is dying. The university system is based on the printing press. And like when I, like when I started going to university still, like back in the early 2000s, like it still kind of meant something that I had access to the school's library. Like, and if you go back 50 years, if you go back 70 years, like you would pick the school you're going to based on if you could have access to that library. Like, I could have access to Princeton Library. Are you kidding me? That's so cool. Now it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> you can get access to the whole human knowledge anywhere, right? It, they don't have a, a, a monopoly on, 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 on this because they could build that monopoly through printing press technology. We could print, print books. You couldn't get that information anymore. And that's been shown in numbers. Universities are really suffering. Yeah, and people don't care anymore. Like, if I had, like, if you had, to, like, I got a PhD and a postdoc. If I had a PhD and a postdoc 75 years ago, you're fucking made. That's all you need. Like, where would you like to work? <laughs> now it doesn't fucking matter. You have a master's, congrats, everyone has a master's. You have a doctorate, congrats, you're unemployable. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> just, like it's, it, it doesn't matter anymore. So, so, you know, it, it, the whole system, what well, I'm saying, the whole system's breaking down, but we've got to build a new one. How to build a new one, right? It's an open question, because no one's really thinking about this on a deep structural level. I think some of the, the ideas that Fotis is exploring is a, a good example of like, what is a measure of interdisciplinarity? Like, what is a measure of progress in interdisciplinarity? I think it's like, can a group of interdisciplinary thinkers really build another system? Like, that would be progress. Like, if we could build another system that actually would open up emancipatory intellectual possibilities, right? It's not necessarily measured in, like, uh, whatever professors measure their value in, like, uh, your Google index, what is it? Like, your, cit your citation index, your H. The number of citations. The number of citations. Like, like that's basically like a proxy for your zig size. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I've got this many citations, like, I'm, I'm, I'm the king, I'm the king researcher, right? Like, that doesn't matter anymore, like, we're going to have to build a new system. So, you said in the previous class that each meta system is yeah. bigger than the previous one. So, good point. So, space and time, it's, it's, it, it covers more space, yeah. so, like, like, bands and tribes to city-states, more space. And even when the city-states are aggregated into empires, like, those empires 
only exists because of feudalism and slavery. Like, it's not like a real, I'm a part of the nation, but that I'm going to die for. Right? Like, so it, it's not like a real like, group identification in the way that with industry, with nation state, I'm England, I'm Spanish. Right? Like, and I care about England, and I care about Spain, and England and Spain care about me. And, 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 and there's a reciprocal relationship here that's being developed between, this is key for political theory and liberal democracies. Liberal democracies are based on that there's a genuine reciprocal relationship between the nation state and its citizens. Right? And, 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 and that's the ideal, right? Which is not what's going on in empire. There's not a genuine reciprocal relationship in empire between Roman citizens and Rome. Rome is the king, Rome is the monster. If Rome wants to kill you, you're killed. And no one will give a shit, because it's Rome. Rome can do what it wants. China can do what it wants, right? That's not the case for England and Spain and modern nation states, United States. It's not the case, right? Less the case. More and more less the case, like in, like if you watch like documentaries about World War I, the German kids going off into World War I, they're excited. Like, I'm pumped. Like, I get to die for Germany. That's dope. That's not the case anymore. Like, if Germany's going to war, the German kids are not going to be psyched about that. Like, they won't want it. Like, they'll resist that. They'll resist it. No one wants to go die for the country. Right? Because the whole system's breaking down. But the narratives are changing. It's, it's so important. The it is. Narratives. It is. Right? We are narrative creatures. Yes. Absolutely. We are narrative creatures. We live in narrative. And we have like explicit ones and implicit ones. Absolutely. And implicit one is I'm going back for Germany, you know. But the implicit one is maybe, yeah, I'm protecting myself and my family. Yes. Like uh, another discourse. Absolutely. You know? Very good point. So like this brings us back to like I, I mentioned in the first lecture, Hegel's theory of state. Hegel, and so this will connect to explicit and implicit language. Yes. So like, in, and so like Hegel inspires Marx. So it's crucial. So like with Hegel, you have family, community, and state, right? So the explicit narrative of Germany or England or whatever is nested within implicit narratives of community and family. They're all connected. It, it is a, a, a neat, I don't know how to say that in English, like... Um, they're entwined, they're niche. intertwined. They're, 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 no, no. They're knit. They're, they're knitted together. Yeah, yeah, they're exactly. knitted together. It's a fabric. It's That's all they say. It's a social fabric. But it's fabric, and then one... Uh, it's, they're it's, layered. Layered it's layered. It's layered. Fabrics. And those are discourses. Absolutely. Um, it's layered discourses. Yeah, exactly. Implicit to explicit. And, 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 and intentional, like and intentional. At the two levels, you know? Absolutely. So all of these things, like when an explicit narrative is breaking down, it's probably evidence that the implicit narratives have broken down already and no one's noticed. Right? Because it's unconscious, mm -hmm. right? If if like like take for example, like I I think, well from my observation, I think it's harder and harder for the next generations to build families. I think they don't know how to build family. They don't have good models for family building, and they don't know how to think family because the implicit narrative is broken, right? We're no longer embedded in the implicit narrative of family. We're no longer embedded in the implicit narrative of community, which is an interesting way to think about SEMF, what's going on here, because SEMF is explicitly from the start of the conference talking about not just mathematics, but a mathematical community. It's trying to build a community. Now, Hegel would say, if you're thinking about community and you're not thinking about family, and you're not thinking about state, then you're not thinking about the whole picture. You're not thinking about how it's all knitted together. You have to think about family. You have to think about community. You have to think about state. You have to think about them all knitted together. They need to begin to break. You know? No break. Community without family and community without state is very it's fragile. It's not going to cohere. It's just going to be something that comes and goes. I was going to say, family without community is also quite precarious, I think. Uh, they all need each other. Yeah, they all need each other. Because family of... without community is too isolated. Yeah. They, it... Community can enrich family, and family can ground community. Can, no. no family no. can be a ground of belonging. No, no, but the word you are using, mm -hmm. can, is not can, it, it does. 
you know, like, it doesn't, like, if you don't have that, you don't have the other one. I think they're all interconnected. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're all, I, I think they're all interconnected. Yeah, yeah. They're all interconnected. All right, so like that's where we are. And then like the idea that I share in my thesis is the idea of the commons. Just one sec. So the idea of the commons is, it's, it's more like a very open exploratory concept more than anything else. It's, it's just trying to frame a word that's not reducible to communism, but also getting us to think about common problems that require political action on a common level. And if we don't, then there are existential threats, basically. So we have the information medium, the internet. We have the potentially, we have the need to develop another energy system. Renewable energy system is, I think, the most common way of thinking about it. And then a control system, which I think we should actively think about the phenomenon of what are called supranational entities and international entities. Supranational entities are like the United, or sorry, like the European Union is a supranational entity, right? And it's super problematic, but it's also super necessary. It comes as a response to the world wars and it stopped the world wars in Europe. It's success. I think it's a massive success, the European Union. And yes, we can criticize it and it should be criticized. We should constantly be criticizing and reinventing these things. Um, but we need something also beyond. And the, the European Union is really going to be tested in terms of like, Will it last? And I think it, like, that, that major test is coming with the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, right? Because the, the question is like, how does the European Union respond to this tension, which is just growing and growing and growing? Um, yeah, I wanted to come back to the idea of the meta systems because we discussed, you know, like the new equilibrium, yeah, but not the transition phase. Yeah, I thought you mentioned the idea of like let's build the new, the new meta system. Yeah, but it see, that seems like this nice democratic idea. Let's sit down and talk this through. No, it's, but it seems much more messy. And when I look at AI and the idea of you know less workers, yeah, the end game of an artificial general intelligence is yeah. you don't need workers at all anymore. Absolutely. And for me, that seems super dangerous because yeah. right now we have the division of power because of different supply and demand of necessities. But if you have one corporation or entity that, you know, dictates what AGI is doing and it provides everything we need and it requires nothing that we can provide, yep. that is a shift in power towards that entity. 100%. So, like, what you're saying, like, like, hundred. Oh, yeah, but it's an AGI, so, <clears throat> so it just builds its own energy. So, uh, so in that, right now, it can't. No, it. right now we don't have right it. Right now, it is like. Yeah, for well, now, like right so now. So we can exactly what you're saying. A hundred percent. Right. So I did talk about this yesterday. A hundred percent, what you're saying. So what you're saying, and in, in, and this is what I get into the paper, is that the notion of commons has different dimensions to it. And, and again, commons is a negative signifier. It's basically saying these are negative common. These are common problems that we all share. And one, like, one of the dimensions of the commons is technology, AGI. That presents common threat, like automation is, is, is an example, right? Um, but also bioengineering, like these, these, or, or, or like I gave the example of coronavirus. Now that yeah. we're all super interconnected, like a disease that goes off in China affects the whole world, like within a week it spreads, right? And there's different dimensions of common problems. So like, like global warming is, is, I would say, a common problem. Like it's the whole planet is, is going to have an ecological transformation on a mega order by the end of the century. So I'm saying that as we planetize, as we globalize, there's going to be more and more problems that are shared by all human beings. And the question is, can we develop a discourse and can we coordinate uh, collectively to deal with those problems? And that brings us to questions of uh, the coexistence of different political systems. Right, because a liberal dem every every everyone is not a liberal democracy. Uh, there there are different systems. China's a different system. Russia's a different system. These are different political systems. There's consequences: geopolitical tensions, wars, violence, uh, in relationship to, to to these. And so, if if we can't develop some sort of notion of a commons and how do we collectively respond to things that affect us all, then that, that, that's a, this is a task for our century. I think. I have a question about like, uh, you know, there are like, a few ways to, to see it to, like, in the control part, you are uh, addressing the government by like, having broader and broader uh, and like, uh, 
systems? Systems, yeah, or some yeah, cooperation with the systems. And but I'm also interested to know uh, there is another way to solve problems is uh, working at the minute level and on, on people. Like uh, if you change, uh, uh, maybe you cannot do this without changing systems. But if you change people, like to, to be more pro-social, for example, or more open or be more capable and you know, more generalist, for example, in some way, I don't know, no, uh, and finally we can't do that, of course, as a system. But uh, it's, uh, they can kind of connect, uh, I don't know, don't talk, uh, but bottom up, uh, in a way. Yeah, I think it's, it's going to take probably both bottom up and top down. I, I don't think that just one is the solution. I think that, that we're going to need bottom up organizations as well, but just, you know, Asking people to be more pro-social is, uh, I, I don't, I don't maybe, know. Maybe not asking that. Maybe solution. some some sort of training, you know. Maybe we are lacking in some, you know, educational shift or whatever. I think that the social foundation, I think that, that in many ways, because of this meta-system shift, we haven't, I would say, like, if we're going to start from the bottom up, my thesis would be, for the next system, how do we do family, community, and state well? I think those are just the practical questions. I think we need to re like, and so starting from the bottom up is family. If family's not the ground, then you're in big fucking trouble as human beings because we're not getting rid of family and we're not doing family well. Yeah. So that's the ground. Like if we're not doing family well, we're fucked. And, and so in that sense, what I was talking about yesterday is that we need to reconcile with the fact that at least in the West, our civilizational ground and our sacrificial ethics of family comes from Christianity, plain and simple. If we don't reconcile with Christianity in some way, and I don't mean identify with Christianity in some with fundamentalist religion. way. With a spiritual With some... Not Christianity. With, You're limited to Christianity? Uh, not limited to Christianity, but I'm saying that the West should reconcile with its metaphysical ground. Maybe not. Maybe that's not the solution. It's metaphysical ground. Like, uh, it's metaphysical ground could be another kind. It could, of, of, it, of, it could be of, another possibility. I don't want to get too far. Yeah, yeah. It has to be something that deals with family. It has to yes, reinvent yes. family. So when you say family, family is, yeah. is it like broader family or is it just like we have to be able to, We have to be able to reproduce our species. Okay, and if so we're not, if we're not reproducing our species and if we're not reproducing our communities, then then we're not going to exist. And so that is the perfect transition toward... But I wanted to say something. I just want to limit, though, because I also have a lot of it to get to, yes, so very quick. Uh, yeah, real quick. Like, we are going very fast right now. Yeah. And you're speaking about the um, information era, era yeah. in, and the metal system for but I don't think we are there anymore. Like, I think that was the era of the internet. We are not there anymore. Like, it is possible that, that we are in, in an edge, you know? Because the artificial intelligence bringing, uh, is dealing with the problems with the information era. But the, the thing I want to like, um, express right, right now is we didn't deal with the problems with that era, and we are entering enter in another era, and we, we right. didn't resolve like, the internet, that. The internet opens up a new capacity for coordination, and the internet of things is like basically linking up with the artificial intelligence and eventually artificial general intelligence. It's, it's, it hasn't reached its full maturation as a system, but what it hasn't dealt with yet is a sustainable energy uh -huh. grid in this way of thinking, and we're still using outdated political systems. We're Wait, still, said, we're still using the political. We're still in this is like we're in a tension space. Okay. We're not. We're in. We're in a space where this system is breaking down, uh -huh. and this system doesn't exist yet. Okay. Right on the level of energy and control, it doesn't exist yet. We're still using outdated systems. We're still, we're still moving through transitions of power and we're still fueling our civilization in a way that we were doing for the industrial period. It hasn't changed, right? There's a ground level transition that hasn't happened yet. But in regards to the ground being family, it's basically the question of can we continue reproducing the species in this new system? And that brings us to, I think, what I want to emphasize is, and I prepared us for with the talking about cosmic evolution, which is, I think, the central contradiction of being human this is the symbol for contradiction, is that we reproduce biologically and we reproduce culturally. We reproduce both ways. 
And no other organism deals with that contradiction in the same way. So we have the bio and the cultural. And what human history and human cultures have never solved is how to do both well at the same time. We're never capable of doing well both at the same time. If we emphasize the biological, we reduce a lot individual freedom, and we reduce a lot cultural creativity and sacrifice for reproducing ourselves biologically in the family. A lot of people resist and rebel against family because it, resist, it reduces their cultural creative capacities. And, and they feel restricted to that. They don't feel like they can explore and create on the same level. It's going to be a, a conflict. And it's specifically a conflict of time and energy. Right? Like, with what I'm doing right now at Philosophy Portal, I don't know if I can do that and support a family at the same time. I don't know. Right? If I have kids, if I have, that, that, if I have to be a father, that's going to be a very time consuming. It's going to be a lot energy intensive. Right? I don't know if I can do both. Right now, I'm doing this, cultural creativity, but I haven't reproduced myself. Right? And a lot of people can't, can't, can't solve this. I think it's the fundamental thing we struggle with. So the cultural dimension and the biological dimension. So if you go really far in the cultural creative direction, usually you don't reproduce. If you, unless you're super successful, in which case then like you could be someone like Elon Musk and he has like 15 kids because he's got like billions of dollars, right? So it's, it, all right, I've got billions of dollars. I can reproduce as much as I want, right? Then biologically, then you reduce your culture. So I think there's a huge trade-off here and I think that we haven't, we, we haven't developed evolutionary theory to the level where we can really think through what's going on here, because there's strange things going on here. At the beginning of the century, the UN was making predictions that by 2050, the whole of the, it's called the demographic transition. The UN predicted that by 2050, all countries in the world would make it through the demographic transition, which starts in the Industrial Revolution, by the way, which is a trade-off where we stop having like six or seven kids, and we shift to having two or three kids. So there's a, a shift from quantity of kids to quality of kids, and there's an increased investment in parenting. But the idea that, and so replacement level for our species is two, right? That's 2.1, I think, is the exact number. But what's shaking these models, what's disrupting these models, is that when you get fully developed countries, you don't get a, a nice plateau at two. It drops below two. Right? And most countries that reach developed levels drop below two. So it, you know, some are at like one, some are at like 1.5. Some are dropping below one, which means we're just not reproducing. Right? And then if you, met, if, you, if you spread that around the whole planet, then all of a sudden you have a problem of what is happening evolutionarily speaking? Because that doesn't happen in biological evolution. It doesn't happen that a species would just actively take itself out of the gene pool. But also in biological evolution, you don't have any species that are actively reflecting on their role in evolution. Humans are actively reflecting on their role in evolution, right? Which seems to have an effect. Okay. I don't know if you agree, you would agree with this approach, but you have this conflict and you have this dichotomy between the biology and the cultural part. Yeah. Do you think that's set up like a... At uh, a natural selection in which the individuals which focus on the cultural part but don't reproduce. If the, that could be entangled genetically, if you could that, say that that is determined gene genetically, that could go more. And the individuals that focus on the biology part, those are the ones whose genes would go down to the next generation. So, kind of opposed to the cultural part. Yeah, so this is happening. So, that, like, that, that this, there's a huge, interesting cultural tension that's emerging. From the groups that I'm studying, the way they frame it is that you have people trying to reinvent a trad lifestyle and focusing on having like five, six kids. And their idea is if you can get five to 10% of the population in any given region to have five or six kids again, then you solve the issue. All you don't need everyone to have many kids. You just need like five to 10% of people to have lots of kids. If that's happening, then kind of it would plateau again. And then they frame the antagonist being what they call the global monoculture. The global monoculture is basically everyone aggregating in city states, everyone aggregating in cities, not reproducing, and focusing on cultural creativity. And so there's a tension here 
between people, and basically this mirrors like a tension of like these menaces. Like, let's move out of the cities, let's go back to the country, and let's just have a lot of kids again. And let's live, live on a farm, right? I think this tension is not really thinking about this problem deeply enough. So because they're, they're, they're just living out the past. They're not really reconciling with what's coming, right? Like, we have to reconcile with what's coming globally. And I think that, like, I think the major thing, I think this would, like, really be the revolutionary thing, and I'm trying to, like, actively think about this, is between men and women, if you have men and women who are, by and large, well-educated, hyper-well-educated, uh, career-focused, living in cities, those three things, can men and women still do long-term relationships with those three variables? If you solve that, you solve this. And I think that's possible, but it will take new types of subjectivity. Men and women new who... Narratives. New narratives. Yes. New narratives, absolutely. I think it's possible to have a system that allows for long-term relationships, but not reproduction. I don't think it's as simple as allowing for long-term relationships. That's a start. It's a start, but it's not. It's not the, fi like, the, the, the final. The fi it's not the, fi the, the final would have to be political economics. Yeah. So political economic, to me, it would have to be, uh, the two dimensions would have to be, I think, um, a, a new, we, we need, I think, a new social contract. It would have to take a new social, and what I mean by is, like, in the 20th century, we, we did have a new social contract. It's called the welfare state, right? Which is basically a new opening of socialist possibilities, which is not reducing us to... Socialist? It's socialist, absolutely. So, like, I still think, like, I don't want to jump too far to fucking communism. I think that's dangerous. But, like, I think that we should think more actively no, between capitalism and socialism. Like, we have to think socialism again, and that's what I mean. It's a new social contract. And a new social contract where, like, I mean, some countries are experimenting with this, but it hasn't gotten a lot of experimentation, is, like, where states should actively be friendly to making families. Like, if you're building a family, maybe, it, like, replace the welfare system. I don't know if basic income is the right idea. It still doesn't work. I mean, compared to, like, yeah. compared to the same way you have, like, Three weeks of maternity leave, like in, a, in my country, it's two years. Yeah. Two years? Yes, yeah, leave well to them. That's the truth. Yeah, the experiments so, haven't been successful. Good class are somewhere else. So, I, look, for me, like, I'm just proposing ideas here, very speculative, but, like, but, this, but, this, but this, this is not an easy problem to solve, and no one has the answer yet. So, what does the, you, you propose that the causes are mostly economical and the pressure? To Partly, I think that if you go to the ground level, though, I think that in terms of like men and women are basically the same as they've always been. Like men and women, 500 years, biologically speaking, like we're still men and women. I mean, culturally, a lot of things have changed. Technologically, a lot of things have changed. But the way in which men and women relate here no longer applies. The way in which men and women relate here no longer ap applies. And so men and women don't know how to relate to each other in the same you way. You mean relate? What, in what sense relate? Like basically being able to build a long-term relationship that can support what the reproduction other? of the species. Family. Okay. Form families. How do you implicit, like implicit narrative, how do you form families? I think that now when we move from agriculture to industrial, there were major social upheavals and tensions between men and women that were new to the system. And now, there's whole new social tensions between men and women. And those tensions haven't really worked themselves out yet. But my hope would be, when they do work themselves out, what they're pointing towards is solving this issue. So if it's what I was talking about, you know, working like from bottom up and like working with people and, and the word narrative came up, I, I, yeah. I, I talked about my education more broadly. So, I have a question. The, the bottom, so like, the, like I said, the bottom up I think would, would go here. Like you start with family, well you start with, you start with yourself as an individual and how you relate to others generally, but then it has to move to family, then it has to move to community, then it has to move to state. And these things have to be rethought in the context of this tension here. But that would be the bottom-up approach, as opposed to the, let's say, top-down approach, 
which would be thinking about international organizations and, and things like that. I think uh, comp like both, like why not think both? It's like a circle. Um, I, since the foundation is funny, I don't think we have really gone in any detail in the, in the structure. Yeah. Because historically, like yeah. we have ended up with a structure of funding. Yeah. And, and it's imposed it's by a metaphysics. Kind of re uh, recent. We should reinvent family. So what are the structures of family? I think the most about? general concept is long-term relationality without any pre-given categories of the hit of history. Like, 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 for example, like traditional conservatives in the 20th century, like it has to be a man and a woman. Like it has to be, you know, it has to be a specific set of categories. I think that, okay, we've challenged that. Like that's post-modernity. We challenge all those historical categories. But I think what you get, what you remain is, if you just challenge all those categories and you, and you, and you don't value long-term relationality, generally speaking, what you get is a very short-term, pleasure-based, liberal hedonistic society. So what we have, like the real challenge is how do you take, okay, you, you confront the fact we live in a short-term, immediate attention economy, it's pleasure-based, it's individualistic satisfaction, and that has to be recognized as a dead end. And then you say, okay, that's a dead end. Where do I go from here? Where I've went from there is long-term relationships are important, long-term relationships are valuable, and they're difficult, but that difficulty pays off. It's painful, but there's also joy. There's pain, but there's joy. You have to accept both. And you have, when you confront pain that you don't know how to symbolize, and when you confront pain that you don't know what to do with, you have to be able to sit in that pain, and it will pay off. There will be joy on the other end if you're willing to work through with that person. Also, sexuality. I'm not against polyamory, but I also don't think it's sustainable on scale for most people. It's just not. I don't think it's going to be. I think, could it work for some people? Sure. But as a large scale strategy, I think it gets in the way of, of family building and I think it gets in the way of community building. So basically, long term relationality where sexuality is properly contained so that we can focus on things unrelated to sexuality, because that's the great thing. When you contain sexuality to a long term relationship, guess what? You can focus on everything else. Because if you're just spinning around in circles of polyamory, to me, in my experience, and I'm not without experience, in my experience, you can't think about anything else. It just I'm, consumes your entire psychology I'm because not, it's... I'm not sure if this is applied. Like, it has to do, like, with the kind of people that are graphic, like, neurocognitive, too social, like, uh, issues, like, they... It, 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 we have to be more precise in terms of like what kind of people are we talking about, basically. But well, I think it's, it's I, 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 I'm speaking in, I, for the sake of time, because I don't have much time left. For the sake of friendships, no. For, I'm just I'm disruptive with them. Kind of French, friendships are also disruptive. Friendships are also super important. Like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that we all have to be monogamous. Uh, that's too general. That's too universal. I'm just saying that. I, it's hard for me to see polyamory scaling, but if you, if, but if a group, if groups, if, if groups locally can scale that, go for it. I'm not against it. I'm but just, they can work like, both. Think about Greece. What hmm. happened there? It was that the relation between a man and a woman was supported, but all uh, other relationships also like. Right. Well, it has to be all this. You had the basis. Well, this, uh, you, I mean, you, you, community. Communities are what? Ideally, communities are friends. Uh, you have good friendship base. You have a, a diverse network and also uh, an extended family. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't have extended family. And the only friends, like, it becomes very dogmatic. Just away. I'm not trying to limit anything. I'm just trying to outline a general set of, of, of ideas that might help. And I'm not against polyamory. I'm not against yeah, yeah. alternative forms of living. Yeah. Do whatever you like. I don't care. I'm just trying to say that at the end of the day, I think this is the problem that we're struggling with. Like, this would be the real evolution. The real evolution would be if we can do both of these well. And if you could do both of those well, you're gold. I mean, that, I'm just, that's what I'm shooting for. Really, I think it's really interesting what you said about this. There's this group of people that they have like five, six children. And this group of people, yeah. it's really hard for them to really 
reduce yeah. because they are focused on the things. Yeah. That really drove my attention because there's this concept that is pure sociality. You use sociality? You, yeah, you use sociality. It really looks like that, you know? It really sounds, sounds like it. Yeah. So there's a deal of a few things Yeah, I mean, and, and, and maybe that's the way it goes. It could be. I know, I know there are activist political orientations. I, I, like, I, I study them, I follow them. Like, there, there are people who are trying, like, their life goal is, in this one group I'm studying, it's like, in United States context specifically, they're trying to, again, get to like 5 to 10% of the American population to choose that lifestyle. Like, that's their life political goal. And, and, and so maybe, maybe that's part of the solution. Maybe that's part of the solution. Um, and, and then there are other groups. I mean, there are more and more people. Like, this is really interesting, deeply. It's interesting. Like, what's interesting is, like, we've never had more adults on the planet today who are not tied to family. No who are not tied to family, who are not reproducing. So, so, and, and so there's something interesting about that, too, right? So, so maybe both can coexist here. Yeah. It also goes the other way and sort of offspring detaching from parents is more common than it has Very. Been. There's a generational breakdown. Yeah. So, the, the, so like, my, my, like one of the theses that like this, I said in the first lecture, there's a book I've sort of half written, which this is like the central idea, is like religions have basically, I think, been to hold the generations together. Like, and so, and, and this, this reflects a certain system where uh, kids can look up to parents and kids can look up to elders and say, what my dad's doing, what my mom's doing, that's what I'm going to do. And more and more, that's not true. Like, what my dad did and what my mom did is not relevant to me. It's, 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 it's a totally different, and especially like what my granddad did and what my grandmother did is really irrelevant to me, right? So there's this way in which now we're on this spike and the generations have no more contact, which is hugely problematic. So what, what worries me and what concerns me is, um, say, getting spot of some trajectory. And I'm wondering how you can train this kind of magic phenomenon of a growing of a possible decoupling of reproduction from the womb, from the woman's body. It could be. That's also a possibility. And I know for a fact <laughs> been in this. So that brings us another segue. Decentralized science, but there's sort of the new kind of uh, organizations that are, have this role, I, basically, you know, just take it with that if they sell the uh, womb. This could be the future. I was I, I I was I was with this I was with this these conservative groups that are trying to maximize reproduction. When I went to dinner with them, some of the technophilic end of this group, they were like, artificial wombs as quickly as possible. <laughs> artificial wombs as quickly. And I asked my girlfriend. I asked my girlfriend. She's actually my wife. I asked, asked my partner. If artificial wombs were on scale possible, demonstrated, proven, normalized. Would most women, would you? And then do you think most women would pick that? And she said, yes. So the question comes down to women's free choice in the end is if the technological possibility for artificial wombs happens, if it's normalized, if it's affordable, if it's generally available to everyone, that's the question. Will women choose that? And well, that's just an open question for the future, isn't it? But it brings us. I guess this is a huge social political tension of a new kind of it is. And so this is why if you radicalize this, if you radicalize this, and in my thesis, I radicalize it to its most extreme possibility. So if you radicalize this to its most extreme possibility, what we're dealing with is, a, and, and again, thinking in cosmic evolutionary terms and thinking about how biocultural evolution is cosmically strange and doesn't fit. And you cannot think about human beings existing for 20, 10 million years. It doesn't make any sense for humans to exist for 10 million years. We don't operate on those time scales. We're a different type of being than that. Other organisms exist for that amount of time as a continuous genetic structure or something like that. That what we are, possibly, speculatively, is a transition from, let's say, the biocultural to the technocultural. And the technocultural is hypothetically, I explored in the thesis, is another form of evolution. It's a form of evolution that's emerging. And the, 
The term I use is atechnogenesis, which is just a, an invention on the concept abiogenesis. So like abiogenesis is the birth for going from biology, so going from chemistry to biology, and that was the birth of a new evolution. And it could be that what we are is sort of chemical processes which are catalyzing a new evolutionary process that would give birth to, let's say, the techno-cultural evolutionary pathway. And the techno-cultural evolutionary pathway would operate differently. And I think that like, well, like the actual hypothesis would be that, so I make two predictions based on this idea. One, the first prediction, and like, I don't know how these predictions are holding up, but I kind of just like pay attention to these two things as like a prediction. So the first prediction is that humans will shift more time and energy towards cultural reproduction over biological reproduction. So more and more, like that will just continue. The second thing would be that humans increasingly, uh, let's say, adapt or transform biological functionality to technological functionality. So like, for example, like in their primitive form, like there's like Elon Musk put like the neural link in this guy's head who was paralyzed or something like that so he could like, and this would just happen more and more. Like my granddad had an extra 15 years of life because he had an artificial heart, right? And the, like these test cases, like as our biology breaks down, basically you get natural guinea pigs for technological modifications. And then if those technological modifications get really good, say in the next, who knows? I don't even care about the time scale. Could be 100 years, could be 500 years. What I'm thinking about is that humans can't exist for like 10 million years. It doesn't make sense. I don't know what time scale it'll unfold on, but like there will be these two processes would unfold the biocultural to the technocultural. And then, so like, and then I'll just finish the, the thesis, like of at least the third part, is that, and I'm skipping over very much, not going into too, as much detail as I can do to go, but it's in the thesis. So once you've got this hypothesis, that this transition could be what we are, then you have the question of the deep future. And the question of the deep future is, what does the technocultural evolutionary process do? Like, what's the, what, is, what is the nature of the technocultural evolutionary process? And the two hypotheses I explore, one is called expansion. And expansion, I'm not gonna spend too much time on expansion, but expansion is very common in our science fiction imagination. So in our science fiction imagination, what happens? We expand, where do we expand? Into space. And, and it, it follows like a natural process where we go from being a planetary civilization to a solar system civilization, to a galaxy civilization. You know, so, and, and so this is very common in Star Trek and Star Wars. We interact with other alien species elsewhere, but it's always done, and this is where like the 20th century science fiction imagination looks really silly, is like, it's always done with humans being the same. Like we're the same biologically, we're just now in space. I think all evidence points towards this is not how it will happen. <laughs> because humans biologically can't exist in space. That's why we don't go very often. That's why we just send our machines. We send technology into space. Our technology is everywhere in space, but we aren't because we are evolutionarily adapted to this planet. We cannot unadapt to this planet. The only way we could adapt to space is if we were technocultural. So the hypothesis would be that technocultural beings expand into space. That's one deep future trajectory. The other deep future trajectory, which is much harder to think and which has much fewer representations in science fiction, but I think it's a super interesting possibility, is what I call the compression hypothesis. The compression hypothesis is that we go into inner, either we go into inner space, so we don't expand outwards, but go inwards through technology, like so through like going from like nanotechnology to Planck technology. And there are some like scientists who think about like what would Planck technology look like? Uh, and what would those environments, what would those conditions look like? What would that be like? And so like a transcension, there's like weird ideas about it. But the other possibility, and this is inspired by 
a group called the Evo Devo Universe Community, is that we haven't yet figured out what techno-cultural evolution means cosmically. And it could be that what, so this is the hypothesis, is that what techno-cultural evolution means cosmically is that it plays as a function to create universes. And I think that's a really interesting idea, especially in the context of um, Stephen Wolfram's work, because Wolfram talks about universe creation, creating universes and stuff like this. I don't know like if he's thinking about it in this way, but I do have, I did, I went through my thesis yesterday and I, in this section of the book, I actually do quote Stephen Wolfram. And uh, I quote Stephen Wolfram in this idea that Wolfram says that uh, effective immortality is inevitable. He, this is, there's a section of the, a new science where he says, effective immortality is inevitable. It's just a question of what does that other side of death look like? That's the quote I, I derive from him. I, and I connect it to the compression hypothesis in the sense that maybe what technocultural evolution is doing is, uh, is, is, is participating in some sort of like multi-universe process where uh, the mystery of why the initial conditions of the universe are the way they are is because they were intelligently designed in some weird way, but they're intelligent. And so, so, so there's a non-random intelligent process at work in the creation. That's just a possibility. These are just speculative ideas. It's just this, this section of the book, I just sort of let myself go crazy a little bit and just speculate because I, I think we do need to speculate about these things more because why not? Uh, I think that if you follow the logic of the book, it, it leads you to these crazy conclusions. And, and that's actually, and then I'll close here. That's what attracted me to the ideas of technological singularity originally, was that they open up so much speculative possibility. Like it really opens your mind. It really challenges the way you think about nature, reality, what the human being is. And I just sort of followed that and, and like say, like, how far can I push this type of thinking? Um, and so if you, if you want to learn more about it, you can email me uh, and I can send you the PDF. And then uh, if you're interested in following my work, philosophyportal.online, and, and, and that's the end.